Good morning and welcome to the 32nd meeting <clears throat> in 2014 of the Health and Sport Committee. I would ask everyone in the room to switch off mobile phones uh, as they can often interfere with the sound system. Although, um, for the perceptive, you will see some of uh, us using um, the committee members and indeed officials using tablet devices and of course this is instead of the hard copies of our papers. Uh, we have some changes in membership today. Um, and we welcome Mike McKenzie and Dennis Robertson uh, to join us as new members uh, to the Health and Sport Committee. Um, a genuine welcome to you both. Uh, and the first item on the agenda uh, today, of course, is to give the new members an opportunity to declare any relevant interest they may have. Uh, can I ask Dennis Robertson uh, first, please? Uh, thank you, Convener, and uh, I would just uh, advise members of my uh, membership interests. Uh, but uh, with reference to uh, health and sport, really, there's nothing to declare. Thank you, uh, Mike McKenzie. Thank you, Convener. Uh, no interest to, de to declare, other than to direct members to my register of interests. Thank you both very much. Uh, the second item on the agenda today is subordinate legislation, and we have five negative instruments before us this morning. Uh, the first uh, instrument is Public Bodies Joint Working Integration Joint Monitoring Committee, Scotland Order 2014 SSI 12014 backslash 281. Uh, there has been no motion to annul. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee uh, has drawn the attention uh, of the Parliament to the instrument uh, and the details, of course, are in your papers. Are there any comments from members? No. no. Has the committee agreed then to make no recommendations? Agreed. 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 Yeah. Thank you. The second instrument is Public Bodies Joint Working Local Authority Officers Scotland Regulations 2014 SSI 2014 backslash 282. Um, again, there has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee uh, have not made any comments on the instrument. Are there any comments from members? There are no comments from men members. Uh, can I take it then that the committee has agreed to make no recommendations? Thank you. The third instrument is Public Bodies Joint Working Prescribed Consultees, Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014283. Uh, again, there has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated uh, Powers and Law Reform Committee have not made any comments on the instrument. Are there any comments from members? There isn't. Uh, can I take it then that the committee had agreed to make no recommendations? That is agreed, thank you. The fourth instrument is Public Bodies Joint Working Prescribed Days Scotland Regulations 2014 SSI 2014-284. Again, there has been no motion to annul and, delega uh, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee have not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, are there any comments from members? There isn't. Uh, then can we take it that the committee had agreed to make no recommendations? Agreed. That's good, thank you. Uh, the fifth um, instrument is Public Bodies Joint Working Integration Joint Board Scotland Order 2014 SSI 2014-285. There has been no motion to annul. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has, uh, has drawn attention of the Parliament to the instrument and uh, the details are in your papers. Are there any comments from members? And I see Richard Simpson. Thank you. I have two comments. One is I'm not quite sure what the proper officer is under Section 3E uh, of this uh, SSI. That's the proper officer of the Integration Board uh, as opposed to the Chief Officer of the Integration Joint Board. Um, so I'm not quite sure what that is. Presumably, it's, as it's from the local government, it's, the, it's in addition to the chief social work officer, so it's some additional officer. And the other comment I have is the fact that there are, is representation from two doctors, uh, one nurse, but no allied health professionals, although, of course, they may be 
appointed under yes, Section 8 uh, of the, uh, 3 8 of this SSI, that is, the Integration Board may appoint such additional members as it sees fit. But I, I'm slightly disappointed that uh, there's no mention of allied health professionals because, in my view, they are going to be quite fundamental to ensuring the success of the, uh, the integration project. Any other members? Um, before we proceed then, Richard, with those comments, can we agree uh, that uh, those comments should be forwarded to the appropriate minister for some clarification? Great. We'll then um, proceed to um, the next question, which is, is, you know, despite those comments or those questions, has the committee agreed to make no recommendations? We agree. We agree. Uh, thank you. We now move then to uh, agenda item number three. Um, uh, which is to return to our Mental Health Scotland Bill and our final evidence session at stage one with the Scottish Government. I can give a, um, you know, a, a, a welcome, congratulations on uh, 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 your recent uh, promotion uh, uh, to, to the Minister. Uh, pleased to have you with uh, the Health Committee, Health and Sport Committee here this morning and look forward to working with you in your new role. Um, um, can we be welcome formally G Jamie Hepburn, Minister for Sport and Health Improvement, uh, Carol Sibbald, uh, Mental Health Scotland Bill Team Leader, Penny Curtis, uh, Acting Head of Mental Health and Protection of Rights Division, and Stephanie Verlo Slough? What is this? Sure. Verlo Slough. Good. <laughs> That was, um, that was um, a difficult one for me this morning, I can assure you. Um, um, uh, can we now invite an opening statement from the, the Minister? Well, uh, thank you. Can you. Thank you for your welcome. I should uh, tell you, I had to check with Stephanie how to pronounce her surname as well this morning, so I, I understand where <laughs> you're coming from. Can I, I also apologise. I, I know this is uh, slightly delayed. I think this got caught up in the... A change of the minister, so I apologise if it's delayed the uh, committee's uh, consideration of the bill. But I'm uh, very delighted to be here as uh, Minister for Sport uh, and Health Improvement, appearing before uh, the committee for uh, the first time. And I do look forward to working uh, with uh, the committee. First Minister's First Minister, of course, stated that she will be seeking a consensual approach. I hope that can be a hallmark of uh, our work. Uh, together. Uh, before I, I get to the bill, uh, can we, I think your clerk had asked uh, for a, a rundown on uh, my responsibilities, which I'm happy to yeah, uh, provide yeah, with you, uh, along with uh, mental health, which will be an absolute uh, priority uh, area for me. Uh, can we, I'll be seeking to uh, engage early uh, with uh, stakeholders in uh, the sector uh, in least that area, but uh, along with uh, mental health, my portfolio includes other areas uh, such as uh, dementia, uh, restricted patients, autism, and learning disability, uh, sitting alongside uh, other matters such as continuing the legacy from the Commonwealth Games and action on obesity, physical activity and healthier working uh, lives. Policy for carers, self-directed support and older people's health will also uh, sit with me. Uh, my colleague Maureen Watt, uh, the new Minister for Public Health, will oversee uh, a wide range of issues including health protection, alcohol and tobacco and child and maternal health. And I'm sure uh, Maureen looks forward to discussing uh, her role with the committee. Uh, to. Uh, turning uh, to the bill, can I acknowledge the work that's been done uh, by the committee uh, thus far uh, going through uh, its evidence? Uh, I have to say it's been very helpful for me coming uh, to this uh, issue somewhat uh, later uh, at stage one. I'm sure it'll be helpful for your new uh, committee uh, members too. Uh, the overarching purpose of this uh, amending bill, uh, to amending the 2003 Act, is to make a number of changes to current practice and procedures to ensure people with a mental disorder can access effective treatment in good time. It seeks to build on the principles of the 2003 uh, Act. The bill uh, also proposes, though, the implementation of a victim notification and representation, representation scheme for victims of mentally disordered offenders subject to certain orders. Uh, these means, this means uh, these victims will be on the same footing as victims who are uh, currently eligible to be part of the criminal justice victim notifi notification scheme. Can I uh, welcome uh, also the high level of stakeholder engagement with this bill. There were over 100 uh, responses to the Scottish Government's consultation on its proposals for a draft mental bill. I know that uh, there were nearly 70 uh, written submissions to your uh, committee's uh, stage one call for evidence, uh, and also I'm aware of the uh, four 
uh, oral evidence sessions uh, that you've had uh, have stimulated some interesting uh, discussions. Uh, I acknowledge uh, continuing stakeholder input, uh, convener. Uh, a small working group has already been convened to look at necessary uh, revisions to forms flowing from the bill, uh, and a second small working group will shortly uh, be convened to consider necessary revisions uh, to the Code of Practice. Uh, and I'm very happy with that, uh, convener, to uh, do my best to uh, answer members' uh, questions, and I do look forward to reading your uh, Stage 1 report when it's uh, available. Thank you, Minister. The first question is from Richard Lyle this morning. Good morning, Minister, uh, and I welcome you to your post. Good morning, well. um, Bob. There are two submissions that have been made to the committee, one from the COSLA and one from the uh, a letter, letter from the Finance Committee. COSLA commented that MHO reports would be triggered in far more circumstances than the financial memorandum anticipates, concerned about the scope of new duties uh, of MHOs and unclear at this stage. However, it's clear that additional cost set out in the financial memorandum is underestimated in the cost associated with the measures contained in the bill. Um, they made reference that the total number of hearings requiring a report could be in the region of over 500, as opposed to the 20 or 40 stated in the financial memorandum. And the uh, financial memorandum estimates the cost of 475 per report. This suggests that an overall annual cost to local authorities of over 281,000 instead of 18,000. And th this again was highlighted in the, a letter to the committee from the Finance Committee. Could you advise us what your view is on these two submissions? Well, convener, as a, a member of the Finance Committee uh, at the time that letter was sent, you might have thought I'd uh, created a, a rod for my own back. We have looked at, at this matter, and uh, in a, a nutshell, uh, the COSA, an a COSLA analysis is correct, but I should clarify at that point, because I've been advised that there is a discrepancy between the bill and the accompanying documentation, which has resulted in some understandable confusion and concern about the number of reports that mental health officers will be required to complete. And I accept, actually, that COSLA are correct in their assessment of the difference between the policy memorandum and the financial memorandum. I should clarify that the policy intention uh, convener as a mental health officer will be required to produce a report where the tribunal is required to review a responsible medical officer's determination to extend a compulsory treatment order or a compulsion order in two specific uh, situations and not the three specific situations described in the explanatory notes uh, accompanying uh, the bill. And the two specific situations uh, are where there is a difference between the type of the mental disorder that the patient has now has now and uh, that record in the original uh, compulsory treatment order or compulsion order, or where the mental health officer disagrees with the responsible medical officer's determination to extend the compulsory treatment order or compulsion order. And there was a, a, erroneously a, a third a situation uh, included. So that shouldn't have uh, been included. So uh, to, to bottom that out, we accept the causal analysis was correct, but on a practical level uh, going forward, we actually estimate, uh, based on the most recent figures for hearings from the Mental Welfare Commission, uh, there are uh, likely to be less than a total of 15 cases a year throughout the whole of Scotland where a mental health officer will require uh, to produce a report as a result of the proposed amendments. And uh, going with the £475 cost per report that Mr Lyle has referred to, convener, uh, the global toss cost uh, would be, based on the most recent year, uh, 7100 and £25, which would of course be spread uh, across all local authority areas in Scotland. But I, and can I apologise for uh, the and to the committee and to uh, COSLA for the understandable confusion that the, uh, the error uh, would have caused. So, so just to be uh, precise, can you remind the committee how many hearings there were last year? Uh, well, there were. this is a slight revision to what was uh, set out in uh, the financial memorandum because the, uh, the uh, figure uh, at that time was slightly higher, but in the last year, uh, Mr Lyle, there were 15 cases. 15. Thank you. Is that you, Richard? You fine? Fine. Right, right, yeah. Richard Simpson? My first question is actually on the same point, that the, uh, even with the very modest um, additional work that has been outlined by the Minister now and clarified, for, which is very helpful, um, in Greater Glasgow and Clyde last year, um, something like 60 per cent or more um, of um, the detention orders, um, there was no MHO report. 
and indeed the annual report on detention by the Mental Welfare Commission has indicated a concern that the overall level is still only around 55, 56%. I think that's the figure. It's somewhere in the mid-50s anyway for Scotland as a whole. So clearly the MHOs are under, already under enormous pressure. So even with a modest increase, um, I hope that the Minister and his team will look very closely at uh, whether there's um, going to be adequate funding to ensure that the MHO report is actually is actually there. Um, my, my question is, is really about the generality of the bill. Uh, this is a fairly uh, narrow bill fo fo focused on the McManus report, um, but uh, we've, we heard evidence from uh, Steve Robertson for, uh, from Learning Disability and also from the round table last week that there is, uh, because of a new information and new knowledge about neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, that it may be that we should uh, consider a, a more extensive review of um, the Incapacity Act and the Mental Health Bill. So my question to the Minister is, um, will um, he, uh, has his, he and his team uh, been looking at that evidence and do they have any comment to make on whether a broader uh, review is necessary or whether we should actually be trying to tackle this bill with some additional amendments uh, which would broaden the scope of the bill at this point? Well, in terms of the uh, issue of uh, a longer term uh, review of uh, incapacity uh, legislation, the committee will be aware uh, that the Scottish Law Commission uh, has recently reported on adults with incapacity uh, legislation. The uh, government is actively uh, looking uh, at that uh, report uh, just now and uh, we're considering and thinking about how we can uh, look uh, more broadly uh, at issues of uh, restriction of, of liberty and capacity and the best way to, to deliver this uh, against a, a background of what is, of course, a, a complex operational uh, landscape. So there is work uh, ongoing. Um, I don't think I can say much more in relation to that uh, just now, uh, Dr Simpson, but I do recognise, of course, this is an important area and we will, of course, come back uh, to the uh, committee with... Uh, details of uh, the government's consideration of this matter uh, in due course. But I am um, uh, uh, acutely aware of uh, the, uh, the views of many people uh, with uh, learning disabilities and uh, autistic spectrum disorders uh, in, uh, in relation to their specific conditions not being dealt with under uh, this uh, uh, legislation. Um, what I would uh, say uh, if uh, those conditions were removed from uh, the scope of uh, this bill, protective legislation would, of course, still be required. As, uh, you know, you've acknowledged that uh, yourself, and that could be argued to uh, add uh, another layer of complexity to what could be felt to be an already a uh, complex uh, legislative uh, uh, landscape, um, and indeed uh, it could result in some people uh, uh, with uh, these conditions finding their a care impacted by up to four pieces of, of legislation, mental health legislation, incapacity legislation, adult support protection legislation and whatever new legislation would be uh, have to be uh, put uh, in place. But let me be clear, and I, I'll go back to the, the point I, I made uh, earlier in relation to uh, wanting to have uh, a, an open uh, dialogue with uh, the mental health sector. Equally, I want to uh, have a, 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 an open an ongoing dialogue with uh, the representative organisations for uh, these conditions. Indeed, uh, tomorrow I'll be attending uh, the autism conference in uh, Glasgow. So what I would say to those organisations, and indeed to the committee, my door is always open and we're happy to consider and look at these matters. But to be absolutely clear, we, we don't actually have any uh, current plans to, to remove uh, people with learning disabilities or autistic spectrum disorders from uh, the scope of the Act. Thank you. That's very helpful, uh, Chair. If I could move on now to something very much more specific, and that is the extension um, of the, um, the period um, which people can, um, for the confirmation of orders, uh, the proposed extension for five to ten days. Uh, when McManus proposed this, the, the number of uh, mental health tribunals that had to be postponed or repeated was mu very much higher than it is today, and indeed uh, pay tribute to the current president, who's uh, or reorganised the administrative approach in such a way that this number has dropped really very substantially and hopefully will continue to drop. Um, so I, my question really is whether this is a, 
um, an appropriate, still an appropriate measure, extending from five to ten days, or, or whether it might have the un unintended effect that, that many more um, applications from RMOs or MHOs will in fact be um, just automatically delayed. So it, it would be therefore extend the period of detention. I know that the Act also says that the, any additional time would be taken off the, the next order, uh, but nevertheless, that really isn't any compensation to someone who feels that their order has been inappropriate in the first place. Uh, I'll just say in passing, I mean, I do appreciate that the number of um, emergency detention orders has been reduced by two thirds under the 2003 Act, which is extremely welcome, and the short term detention orders don't seem to have increased. So we appear to have got it relatively right. But I think you know, the question of the Minister basically is, do we really need this extension now? And if we do, uh, should it not be under absolutely specific conditions? And that is that, the, uh, the, uh, uh, that either the applicant from the mental health side or the, uh, the uh, individual to whom this power, this power is intended to apply or who's going to appear in front of the tribunal for a new order um, seeks to have an extension uh, for some specific purpose. In other words, will the regulations define absolutely and clearly the terms so we do not get the unintended consequence I've described earlier? Well, let, 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 we will not want any unintended consequences with any uh, aspect of uh, this uh, uh, bill and uh, regulations will, uh, we may want to touch on that uh, later, but regulations uh, will come before this committee again. The committee will be able to, uh, 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 to uh, look uh, at that matter. Can I uh, begin? I was trying to look through uh, my notes. I've got a summary of uh, the evidence uh, that you've taken as a committee. I know that this is an area that was touched upon. I, I would also uh, share uh, your uh, welcoming that the uh, number of um, uh, uh, repeat uh, uh, tribunals or delayed tribunals uh, or rearranged tribunals uh, has uh, dropped, but I was still aware that it still uh, can happen and want to uh, minimise that because it always has an impact in relation to uh, the person um, appearing before it. So our position is that we still think this is uh, an effective uh, provision. Um, we, uh, I understand that for uh, good, good uh, clinical reasons, uh, and of course that can vary from case to case because you're talking about uh, clinical judgments in relation to very specific uh, circumstances, applications for compulsory treatment orders uh, might not reach the tribunal uh, until uh, very uh, uh, late on. So that can uh, that can create quite a tight notification period for uh, the, the tribunal, and uh, service users might not have sufficient time to uh, arrange notification, and named persons might have difficulty in arranging uh, uh, a very short notice time off work, and that is what leads to hearings uh, being uh, adjourned uh, and we obviously want to uh, avoid that additional uh, hearings for service users uh, can uh, be very can exacerbate the stress and the, the circumstances uh, they are under so I think in the round I think it's still an effective uh, provision but of course if the committee uh, cares to offer comment in relation to uh, this uh, particular part of the bill we'll look at it very uh, closely but uh, to go back to first principles uh, where uh, the regulations uh, are in place. Uh, of course, we want to avoid any unintended consequences. And again, uh, the committee will have a, a crucial role in assessing that and, and uh, providing your feedback. I'm, convener, I, I mean, I accept that this is a fine balance. You obviously, we do, we do not want to put the, app, the person to whom the order is applying in a position of having repeat, unnecessary repeat, um, rearranged or delayed um, tribunals. Um, however, I w it would be, I think, helpful to the committee if we were to get further information on up-to-date figures on this and an indication of the precise reasons for current delays, rearrangements and uh, repeat uh, tribunals, because that would actually inform us as to whether the, the balance is still right, uh, because McManus was five, six years ago. Yep. And uh, I think in coming to a conclusion in our stage one report, that would be extremely uh, helpful if uh, that's possible. Uh, absolutely, Dr Simpson, and uh, I see uh, officials are assiduously scribbling Nodding. either side of me, <laughs> so they've already taken a note of it. And of course, convener, we'll, uh, we'll get that information to the committee. Thank you. Well, Bob Doris, I think, is he, you, you want to continue on this as well, Dennis? Yes. Right, I'll, I'll bring yeah. you in. Yeah. Bob? Um, 
Uh, good morning, Minister. I think there was a, a number of um, MSPs have got uh, matters in relation to the issue raised by Dr Simpson. I, I'm minded to point out that the Mental Welfare Commission and Mental Health Tribunal both supported the extension from five to ten working days. They, they, they said that um, in a good week or in a good month, about 20 per cent of hearings still went to repeat uh, hearings or multiple hearings because reports weren't prepared for a variety of reasons. And of course, we have to drill down on the reason for for that. So anything we can do to avoid multiple hearings, whether it's not getting uh, the views of the named person, for example, and I'm conscious there's also reforms to the named person process within this bill, which create a knock-on effect, I'd, I'd be keen for you to take cognizance of when, if continuing to go with the extension from five to ten days. However, my, my question is twofold in, in relation to that. The first thing is, I'm content that as long as the extension from five to ten working days is not just seen as an administrative convenience, but is seen as being meaningful to those on, under short-term detention, then I'd be satisfied that this is a, a, a balanced and proportionate step for, for the government to take. So I would, I would look for some reassurances that the government would seek to monitor um, the situation in relation to the reasons for the five to ten working days being, being used or deployed by, by relevant professionals so that it was for the benefit of uh, the person under short-term detention and not for administrative convenience for, for professionals. That's, that's the first thing. If that can be assured, then, then I would be content with it. The second thing, of course, is concerns were raised in relation to the ECHR compliance convener, which we got um, at, at last week's meeting. Now, I made the mistake of asking two lawyers uh, for their views on that and got 17 different views, which was quite helpful. That, that, that's maybe slightly unfair because neither <coughs> lawyer uh, who, who were witnesses at the committee, I should point out, it wasn't legal advice that the committee saw. Um, one spoke about it um, being uh, potentially less compliant and the other lawyer was content that it would still be compliant and it was kind of clear, of, clear as mud at the end of it. But there seemed to be a general feeling uh, in terms of the opinion last week that, again, their concern would be that it, it, it was used inappropriately or was used in, um, uniformly across across the board. So I'm determined to make sure that we don't just get this right in terms of the administration of the system, but in terms of the the, the human rights of, 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 of all our constituents who could be subject to, to detention orders that we get it right for them as well. So information in both those aspects would be welcome, Convener. Uh, of course, Convener, and uh, th thank you for the uh, questions, uh, Mr uh, Doris. I, I mean, let me be clear, <coughs> the uh, provision is not, uh, and I note no the, the point you make that both the Mental Welfare Commission and the Tribunal uh, support this measure. Uh, I, I think they support this measure for the same reasons the government want to take it forward. It's not about their uh, administrative uh, convenience. It's about uh, ensuring uh, the best uh, provision of service uh, for uh, those uh, uh, appearing uh, before uh, before them. Uh, and I go back to the point I made uh, earlier of the, um, uh, and taking on board the fact that there uh, are less uh, rearranged uh, hearings, but there are still some, and we want to absolutely minimise uh, them. They are stressful for uh, service users, and we want to uh, try and reduce them. And that is uh, the primary uh, motivation here in, in terms of giving service users and uh, their uh, the named persons uh, the uh, chance to properly prepare for any hearing. So that is absolutely uh, the motivation here. It's not about administrative uh, convenience. In terms of, I think you asked the question, Mr Doris, about uh, monitoring uh, uh, this, uh, I can uh, assure uh, members of the committee that the bill team will uh, discuss with the tribunal uh, service uh, the type of markers that can be in place to monitor uh, the throughput of cases as a result of this uh, proposed change. We will, of course, uh, monitor this. We have to monitor any uh, list of provisions that we put in place to see if they are uh, effective. Turning to the uh, the second issue in uh, terms of ECHR uh, compliance, I have to say uh, only getting the 17 views from two lawyers could be argued to uh, be a pretty good uh, job, uh, Mr Doris, but uh, we are uh, convinced that uh, the uh, provision is, uh, is ECHR compliant, and I, I think this is of fundamental importance. I used to be 
uh, this Parliament's uh, convener of the Cross Party Group on Human Rights. Human rights uh, issues are something that I care uh, very uh, deeply about. Uh, and I note uh, the comment from uh, the Faculty of Advocates in relation to compliance with the Convention. This would centre around whether the change it was uh, proportionate, and uh, the intention behind this provision is, uh, as I've said already, to benefit uh, the service uh, uh, user. So on that basis, we do think it is a, a proportionate uh, uh, change. Um, we we consider that the provisions of the bill achieve uh, achieve uh, the end of being compliant with the European Convention on Human Rights uh, across the board. So that includes this provision, convener. Okay. <laughs> I think the general point it was made that it could be challenged because what the current situation is compliant, obviously, mm -hmm. but we're going into an area where it could be challenged. I think that's what I took generally out of last week's evidence. Um, and I thought last week's evidence was quite interesting, mm -hmm. at least in the issues that, that raised in discussions. And I'm sure your officials, if you've not had time to read the evidence of last week, it's worth, it's worth uh, some consideration from practitioners, uh, you know, in terms of how the process works and how people, um, you know, and what what time people spend in the system currently, mm -hmm. and whether that would be improved or or, or or diminished. And I thought it was some interesting evidence last week. Well, I, let, let me be absolutely uh, clear, you know, every bit of evidence this committee has gathered, and uh, with particular reference to your stage one report, I don't know if the committee will include this in its stage one report. We will look at it very carefully. Uh, I would suppose I would say in relation to the point you have made that uh, it was felt that this could be subject to challenge, I would say uh, that of course any legislation this uh, Parliament passes could be uh, subject to challenge. It's whether or not of course that challenge would be upheld in the courts, but that's the nature of uh, uh, this Parliament's competence. Any legislation we pass could be challenged uh, through the courts. We consider uh, that this is uh, particularly in relation to Article 5 of uh, EC uh, HR, uh, because uh, uh, Article uh, 5, uh, I think I'm right in saying, uh, uh, doesn't uh, definitively set out a, a time period in terms of which a, a person can uh, be uh, uh, detained. Um, so uh, we think uh, the extra five days uh, uh, in uh, uh, question uh, given the safeguards that we put in, will not uh, fulfil of uh, ECHR requirements. But of course, uh, to go back to the point, we will look at every uh, bit of available evidence. We want to get this right. I've got a couple of bids from, from members uh, who are wishing to ask questions. Um, I, I see Colin with his hand up. Dennis, you, on this theme, yeah, Dennis, yeah. on this theme. Yeah, Colin, on this theme. No. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll put you on the list yeah. then. Thanks. Dennis Robertson. Hey, thank you, Convener, and good morning, Minister. Um, it really, from what you're saying, I think, Minister, can I take it that the, we're looking at the extension is an exempt, uh, exception rather than the rule? And if we're looking at particular conditions that, that may arise for this to happen, would something like... Um, Taking the sort of geography of Scotland, some of the remote rural, and taking in sort of inclement weather, does that give you the sort of flexibility of this extension to take those factors into consideration? I don't think that's. I don't think accessibility in terms of rural areas is really the motivation here. No, no, I don't have motivation. I'm saying, does it give you the the, 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 the the ability, obviously, if those things were to... In fact, we're not discriminating against people that live in remote and rural, far from it. Well, uh, what I'm saying is, because of factors like the, the inclement weather or whatever, um, there could be possibilities that the uh, that extension is necessary, not because of any uh, mental health issue or, or, or anything like that, but because of the actual factors that maybe someone you know maybe couldn't return home, for instance, or whatever. Well, I, I don't suppose you could rule out any possible. I suppose I would make the point that, although I recognise it can be, it takes longer to get to more remote and rural areas. I think uh, the extension from five to ten days. It's not really uh, about uh, uh, that area. What I would say as um, it is driven, I, I repeat the point I've made, it's driven about uh, in terms of trying to improve the experience for uh, service users in terms of, and I think this is more the area in terms of getting time to prepare uh, their, uh, get ready uh, for their appearance before uh, any uh, any tribunal. So 
Um, I think that's the motivation more. But uh, uh, we can explore, we may well explore other areas where I think uh, the issue of um, uh, accessibility for rural and remote areas is more uh, pertinent than in this particular area. Yeah, but uh, again, it's the exemption rather than the rule. That's primarily what you're saying. Well, the fact I'll, I'll is maybe bring up fishers in a minute, but it would be the rule in the sense that it is automatically extended to uh, 10 days. Um, but of course, we will always hope that uh, these matters can be expedited as, as quickly as uh, possible. Yeah, I think as Dr Morrow um, said in, in his <coughs> oral evidence, the tribunal will always continue to work at holding the hearings as quickly uh, as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, and as the Minister has alluded to, the, the main uh, point here is to try and assist service users and named persons um, at what can be a stressful time um, to try and ensure that they their case can be determined at, at the one hearing. Um, I think points about um, in relation to maybe setting conditions, we would the committee might, might want to consider that we are looking at a relatively short time scale here, and sometimes you can overcomplicate um, matters in <coughs> terms of. Um, I saw in some written evidence that. Uh, People would like maybe certain specific circumstances set out, but then you're getting into a scenario of defining what these are. Does that have to be set out in legislation? Um, so it's not that they won't, you know, couldn't be considered, but I think in, in the timescale involved, you, you've um, what we're proposing is the, you know, a, a reasonable uh, alternative. And as the minister has indicated, uh, we will certainly, should this proposal uh, pass through. Uh, the parliamentary process at monitoring um, the usage of this and matters such as the code of practice which the Minister has already alluded to which is under uh, revision we would certainly also be beefing up the text in that in relation to um, responsible medical officers submitting applications uh, mental health officers etc sitting submitting applications at the earliest opportunity I mean, could we, I suppose the point Carol is making is, is an important one. We don't want to overcomplicate the system. And I suppose, uh, going back to the point that <coughs> was made by uh, Mr Robertson in terms of, you know, is this the exception rather, rather than the rule? I'm aware that you took evidence. I Forgive me, I'm uh, wrong. I think it might be Mr Doris that explored this in question in terms of, you know, could this be an exceptional uh, provision? And I understand uh, the intention by that, but I think uh, Carol has set out while why this could be thought to uh, over-complicate uh, 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 matters, particularly, I think, and this is important again, because I make the point, I make no apologies for reiterating the point, we want to make sure this is an improved experience for service, service users and minimise uh, the duress that this system could, because let's face it, it's going to be uh, <clears throat> place them under some duress and stress <coughs> at any rate. We want to minimise that as, in so far as we can and if you add another layer of, um, uh, you know, this is this is only exceptional circumstances, that starts putting it in the mind of the service unit user or their named persons. You know, is this something else that we need to apply for? Um, so, I, I, you know, we want to keep this as straightforward as possible. It can be, but again, of course, if the, the committee uh, makes uh, comments in this regard, we'll we'll look at the evidence uh, closely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving on to Nanette Mellon. Um, I, I want to ask a couple of questions around the issue of advocacy, mm -hmm. which the bill, of course, is silent on. Mm -hmm. um, this actually was raised, I think, at all our evidence sessions, and clearly it was an issue of importance to quite a number of the, the witnesses. Um, many of them actually highlighted that the nature of adv advocacy provision is quite patchy across Scotland at the present time. Um, and I mean, the Mental Welfare Commission felt that really the, the 2003 bill was actually you know, quite a strong right to advocacy, um, but their question was whether it was being properly implemented um, across the country. Um, and they, the, their, the Mental Health Welfare Commission's suggestion was the government might commit to proper auditing of the availability of advocacy and the performances, performance of local authorities um, and health services in really fulfilling the statutory duty. Comments, perhaps, on that. I have another question after that. 
Well, let me say at the outset, I am a strong supporter of, of advocacy. I think it empowers uh, people. Uh, it can kind of work locally with uh, independent advocacy organisations, albeit in probably a, a different context to the one we discussed today, although it occurs to me that organisation uh, may well uh, interact with uh, the framework we put in place to uh, uh, try and uh, uh, help uh, people with a, a mental uh, disorder. Uh, so I am a strong uh, supporter uh, of uh, uh, the provision of advocacy. Uh, when the committee was looking at this, I think uh, it was, um, forgive me if I'm wrong, I think this was particularly in relation to the position of carers, if I remember uh, correctly. And uh, what I can say is uh, that um, the, there are preliminary uh, discussions that have taken place uh, between officials and the uh, care inspector, who are obviously the independent scrutiny uh, and improvement body for care service in Scotland, uh, regarding uh, the possibility of the inspectorate's uh, programme of audit, including uh, a review of how well local authorities are meeting uh, their duties in respect of the provision of advocacy. So it's something uh, we uh, take uh, seriously. That's uh, some work that's uh, ongoing. If the committee uh, felt that that was uh, too narrow, then we can, of course, uh, look at that uh, matter again. But let me assure you uh, that uh, this is something that I, I think is very important as well. So the, the, the carer's question was actually going to be my, my second question. Please. But, but uh, I mean, I think there was, there was certainly quite strong feeling, particularly organisations like SAMH, that mm -hmm. there was, was nothing in the bill to actually uh, <coughs> strengthen the advocacy situation. Well, I, I suppose i go back to the point that was made by the, the, the... I mean, this is an amending bill, so this isn't uh, starting afresh. This is amending the 2003... Act and uh, their point is that the 2003 Act is pretty strong in this area. The question is, are the actual provisions of the 2003 Act being uh, fully met? So we will uh, uh, look at that. I don't know whether this is necessarily a uh, a case for the necessity of uh, any legislative provision at this stage. But I, again, um, uh, and I suppose this is a general point uh, across uh, all uh, of our discussions today, uh, convener. Uh, no, ma uh, no matter what area of uh, the committee uh, comments in this area, uh, in terms of its stage one uh, report, we'll, we'll look at that matter very closely. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Mike McKenzie. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I am, in doing my homework uh, for uh, this committee, I was very pleased to note that um, a lot of the witnesses had placed a high emphasis on the importance of ad advocacy, but and just picking up on this theme, um, I wonder in terms of looking at an accountability mechanism in terms of the provision for advocacy, um, how far uh, that could uh, be directed towards looking at the special issues uh, of geography, the challenges of geography that um, we experience in the Highlands and Islands region, and I'm, I'm struck that you know the health formula, the birth note formula, has a provision in there for rurality, as has the GAE formula, um, the local authority funding uh, formula, and uh, therefore it seems reasonable to me that rural authorities ought to make um, provision for rurality in terms of deciding what resources they. Um, uh, make available for advocacy organisations. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear from the Minister whether in taking forward this accountability mechanism uh, or, 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 or look at accountability to see if there is uh, proper provision of advocacy, how far rurality can be taken into consideration. And the second point I would make is that um, whilst I think we all agree that it's absolutely important that, if at all possible, we can increase um, the provision and access to advocacy um, and independent advocacy, um, how far um, it's possible to say that advocacy, advocacy can be genuinely independent, given um, that uh, advocates and advocates agencies are very conscious of the fact that funding may well come from the very agencies that they sometimes have to challenge. Well, let me say to uh, uh, Mr McKenzie, he's not the only one that's been doing his homework uh, uh, this weekend, coming to this uh, bill <laughs> a, a little uh, uh, later uh, than might have been felt to be ideal. Um, I mean, clearly, in terms of the uh, legislative framework, these are matters for 
uh, local authorities have already given uh, the, uh, uh, the made the point that there are discussions ongoing in, in terms of how we can look at how well local authorities are meeting uh, their uh, legislative uh, uh, duties. Um, I, I suppose we can uh, try and factor in uh, issues of rurality. I mean, I, I suppose with uh, most things in life, it, it, it's just that little bit more difficult uh, in uh, uh, the, the rural uh, uh, areas. So, uh, you know, that's something we can certainly reflect on. In terms of um, the how independent uh, the uh, advocacy agencies uh, are, um, I suppose, as with anything, that's always in the eye of the beholder. My experience, uh, despite uh, it often being the case that they uh, require core funding from uh, the very bodies they may be making representations to on behalf of uh, their client uh, base, they are uh, uh, assiduously uh, uh, clear on the, the need for them to be independent of uh, these uh, organisations, uh, these bodies, uh, and I think they take that uh, responsibility uh, very seriously. But of course you're dealing with a huge range of, of uh, different or organisations, so uh, not uh, every situation will be uh, uh, precisely the same as the other, of course. And j just as a brief follow-up, would you agree that the, the constructive criticism and analysis that advocacy agencies can provide if they meet you know, common issues and so on can be extremely useful for uh, the very authorities that they engage with? And uh, I, I'm, I'm aware of some authorities that uh, you know, appreciate the value of that kind of feedback loop, that mechanism, but others that don't quite appreciate the, the, the value of it. Um, is there anything that you can do as Minister to encourage that um, uh, positive and uh, feedback loop? Well, you know, c criticism can sometimes be difficult to take, but um, if it comes your way, I suppose you've got to reflect on what's said and... Uh, if there's areas you need to improve on, then you need to, of course, uh, look at that matter. But it's obviously very difficult to comment. That's, I suppose, a general comment. I don't know if there's a specific uh, situation Mr Mackenzie has in mind. And even if there is, I'm not sure I'll be able to comment uh, in relation uh, to it. Uh, but um, certainly, I think a uh, process of uh, uh, constructive feedback um, can uh, certainly allow uh, organisations to uh, continue to improve uh, their workings. And, you know, that's not just an issue for local authorities, that would be an issue for um, the, the very bodies that are relevant to this particular uh, bill, the, uh, the Commission and the Tribunal. And indeed, of course, I suppose, uh, as a, a government as well, we need to uh, hear what's said as well. Thank you, Minister. Well, I heard what the Minister said earlier, that, that as a result of this bill, that you do not expect any increased capacity in terms of advocacy as a, as a consequence of any parts of this bill. I think um, you know it's been mentioned by members and indeed reflected in the evidence that it's complementary to all of the, 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 the government's legislation about where we're actually delivering on the, the ground, particularly in terms of delays where you can get good advice and you know avoid certain situations as much as anything else. Uh, has the Scottish Government um, audited, evaluated um, uh, the, the, the advocacy services um, uh, here in Scotland? You know, because I think, you know, I think it's whether it's predictable, whether it's too, just whether it's a perception in rural areas, it's likely to be patchy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Urban areas that the more availability and the problem is maybe access. You know there are, there, there is an issue here in terms of the government's objectives and policies uh, to ensure that they are working effectively for the people that you're hoping that they work for. Uh, advocacy is a key aspect of that, and I was just wondering if there's any recent work that, that in, you know indicates a problem, or a, is there an audit, uh, been an audit of these services? Are health boards um, meeting the responsibilities? Mm -hmm. You know, is there any of that work being done? Well, I suppose I would first of all reflect that uh, advocacy organisations depends what we're talking about here. Because if we're talking about advocacy uh, organisations in relation to the specific bill, and obviously I've referred to some of the work uh, that's ongoing, but I, I'm aware obviously they will interact with uh, elements of the, the public sector on a, a wider basis than just uh, this uh, particular area, and indeed. In, but wider than just uh, uh, the uh, health service. What I can reiterate, of course, is that there is uh, that dialogue with uh, the care inspectorate in terms of uh, assessing 
at how well uh, local authorities are meeting uh, their duties in relation to this le legislation in terms of the provision of uh, advocacy and also uh, the government is working on uh, producing uh, specific advocacy uh, guidance uh, for uh, carers uh, going back to the uh, point uh, explored earlier, earlier uh, with the aim of uh, launching this uh, earlier next year um, and uh, uh, we do believe that that will be a, a useful tool and certainly in terms of uh, uh, making people more aware of uh, their right to advocacy and the fact that uh, these organisations exist. Yeah. So I'm looking to the officials now well, as well. I, as I'll, I'll, I have to tell you, I'll need to look to the officials as well. Because I'm uh, in, sure. terms of, in terms of, has there been an evaluation of uh, effective advocacy services, where they're sparse, where they're being funded properly? Or there's nothing um, that I'm aware of. Um, what the Minister was describing is work we're at an early stage um, of discussion with the Care Inspectorate, very much reflecting some of the um, views that were coming in evidence on the bill. Um, and um, we'll be working with the Care Inspectorate, looking at their work programme to see whether this is something we could accommodate within that. Cause yeah. You know, we would absolutely well, reflect you, what you, you want to come in on this. Can I just clarify just quick, quick look, I mean, in terms of uh, a, a, a review about advocacy organisations, I think we'd need to be clear what it was we were asking about. If it's in relation to the provisions of this specific bill, then obviously there is some work ongoing. If we're looking at a much wider aspect, that maybe have to be something yeah. we need to discuss with other yeah, colleagues I, in I, government. Was, I, I, it, was, it was mainly in respect to the, the, the support for mental health patients, okay. as, as, uh, as this bill is a tidying up, and, okay. and, and the various acts that, 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 that they need advice on. We've had the practitioners in. It wasn't a review. It, no. was, it was trying to pick up on some of the points of Mike McKenzie about yeah. the perception that me advocacy might not be mm -hmm. um, uh, as available, or as indeed expert, or uh, indeed funded and mm -hmm. you know and we've had this uh, at least claimed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that uh, the services are patchy across the country and I think you know both the government and the committee w w w would like to establish whether that uh, you know uh, uh, whether that is a factual position or yeah. not um, you know I, I think that's what we're, we're driving at because I think we all recognize we can legislate mm -hmm. but there might be practical yeah. steps that we could put uh, uh, you know, addressed as part of the evidence that we've taken, that actually uh, highlight how how that uh, legislation could be mm -hmm. um, uh, more effective. You know, and it's objective. But Bob, Bob was going to, if you, sure, if you want to wait, Minister, I think Bob was going to uh, raise some issues on the theme, just, and, and we can get a response. In. Just very briefly, Convener, I'm <coughs> grateful for that, Convener. Just Minister, as I was listening to the questions around advocacy, I was thinking, I mean, I, I don't know a bill yet, uh, this committee scrutinised where advocacy doesn't come up, but it's quite often spoken in very general terms and no one really says, well, what does it mean in terms of the provisions to the a actual bill? So I was given consideration as the discussion was ongoing with the convener over what that would mean in relation to provisions within the bill, and I think you gave some uh, some indications of that yourself. So we had a fairly lengthy discussion in relation to uh, the need from time to time to have the the power to extend um, short short term detention orders from f five to ten working days beyond the twenty eight days. I'm just wondering if sometimes I don't expect you have this answer at your fingertips, convener, but it's a big good exercise for us to, to be aware of whether sometimes the reason <coughs> for the need for that extension might be that the 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 service user or the service user's family didn't have suitable appropriate advocacy to allow them to engage with services in relation to uh, preparation of reports and therefore perhaps potentially greater advocacy could lead to not having to deploy the 10 working days extension and avoid multiple reports and hearings. So that would be advocacy, a concrete example of what advocacy could have an impact. And I know there's various other provisions within the bill, whether it's um, appeal against um, excessive security, whether it's transfer from one uh, hospital to another, uh, or whether it's preparation of advance statements. There are certain pinch points within the bill where perhaps the government could look at and go, is there additional advocacy responsibilities placed there 
or how would advocacy be used? Uh, so that, that, that would be more meaningful to myself rather than a, a general review of advocacy across across the board. I wonder if you could give some consideration to that. It was my loose language. Yeah. I wasn't calling for an over uh, an over review, but I was addressing the evidence we had and the points that were made. Yeah. And it, uh, it wasn't necessary in some of these specialist areas where it's a legal, very much a legal process mm -hmm. when, that we're into and. Um, and there are services provide that. But what, what I was thinking about also was, uh, was the, um, uh, people being aware and encouraged uh, 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 to nominate a named person, for instance, uh, just being more aware of the, a, a, lower, a lower level which would be complementary to, uh, to, 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 to this bill and indeed um, uh, the, the government's objective. But I don't want to labour it too much, um, you know, I think um, we'll probably, you know, after your response, we'll f uh, there's been enough said on it, and it's... Can, can, can I, I say, say, can I, say uh, I, mean, I, do, I don't think you're labouring the point at all, I absolutely think uh, the committee is right to uh, look at this area very seriously, go back to my uh, first remark, I think uh, the provision of advocacy is very important, so the committee is absolutely right to, to look at this, but what, what we will do is we will uh, look... Uh, very closely at uh, any recommendations made and we will look of course again at the evidence session that you've uh, uh, had. I'm inclined to agree with the points that have been made by uh, the Deputy Convener in relation to uh, advocacy absolutely playing a crucial role in terms of improving the experience of uh, service users at certain, I think he used the word pinch points, I think that's a, a very uh, fair way of looking at it. Uh, I'm going to bring Carl in a wee second because uh, what I'm not quite clear on, given that what I've said in relation to the 2003 Act already setting out the right uh, to uh, uh, advocacy, um, I th I'm presuming, Carl can get a comment on this, that that is a provision that will still allow for uh, the interaction of advocacy agencies at these uh, pinch points, as Mr Doris uh, calls them. In relation to the uh, issue of uh, the named uh, uh, person, I uh, uh, agree uh, that um, we need to make sure that, uh, that uh, service users are aware of uh, the, uh, the function of, of such. Um, what I would say is I am conscious that uh, some uh, campaigning body, some of the uh, stakeholders have talked of uh, having awareness raising uh, campaigns and what it does occur to me is you know that can be quite good for a short period of time but once the awareness raising campaign is over and done with um, the, the, you know, the impact could be uh, short lived so I really think we need to uh, look at uh, how we can raise awareness from uh, grassroots uh, level and sort of building upwards uh, from there and uh, Obviously, a number of organisations have a crucial role in relation to promoting the use of named person, the NHS, the local authorities, the government, and of course, going back to uh, the wider point, advocacy uh, bodies themselves, of course, uh, they will want to be, uh, in terms of advocating for an adversary, you know, you have a right to uh, a, a named person. So again, if the committee has a view as to how we can uh, better make people aware of the name person provision, then uh, we'll be very happy uh, to look at that. But can I, I bring Carolyn in relation to uh, the provisions of the 2003 Act and uh, the issue of, of advocacy? I think just a <clears throat> smaller point that I'll pick up on um, in relation to the comments made about the pinch points, which are absolutely uh, uh, correct, that it's critical um, that people do have access to, to advice. and. Part of the role of the mental <coughs> health officer um, is to make individuals aware of their right to advocacy and to help to put them in touch uh, with advocacy agencies. Um, quite often you find as well, I understand that you know, the nursing staff as well are familiar uh, with the good work that is done by advocacy uh, agencies. So assistance will be given to uh, individuals when they're in the hospital setting in relation to helping them access uh, you know, an advocacy service. Okay, we'll move on now to Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Convener. Can I ask um, about the a nomination of a named person? Um, in the bill, there's the provision to nominate a named person, and there is the provision not to nominate a named person. 
But if the person hasn't done either, uh, it reverts back to the 2003 bill where the next of kin is, nomin is, is put into the named person role. I've taken evidence from both uh, service users and carers that uh, they don't like the reversion back to the 2003 Act um, because, one, the carer may not be willing to take on the role and, two, um, the service user may not wish the carer to have, the next of kin, sorry, to have um, that access to their medical records. Have you given any thought to changing that in an amendment at stage two? Well, I obviously recognise this is a very uh, sensitive area, uh, Ms Grant, and I do understand uh, the strong views that have been expressed by uh, stakeholders engaging uh, with uh, uh, the committee that uh, a service user should only have a named person where they want to have uh, a named person. And I think the government is generally uh, very supportive of uh, that uh, uh, generally. And, of course, provisions have been made for uh, service users to opt out of having a named a person. Um, you're correct to identify that uh, if um, an individual uh, has uh, neither uh, nominated a named person or, or not chosen to opt out, then uh, the role essentially reverts uh, back to the person's uh, primary carer or nearest uh, uh, relative. And I, I, mean, I suppose you've made the point there could be many reasons why uh, an individual, either the uh, the, the carer or next of kin or the service user themselves would not want that to be the case. So, I mean, I suppose that the, the government, we, we wanted to do, to retain that provision essentially to, tr only in the best interests of the service user to try and have some form of, of uh, protection for uh, those who uh, uh, lack uh, capacity. But to be fair, I, I think, uh, reflecting on what has been said to the committee, maybe uh, we, we haven't struck the, the right balance and we will uh, be happy to look uh, at this matter uh, again. OK. Um, carers next of kin also expressed the wish that they would have the ability to refuse to be the named person, um, where they were nominated as a named person but didn't feel best equipped to yeah. carry out that role. There was also kind of some discussion around what the role of the carer next of kin would be and that they should maybe have a, a separate role to the named person where they might be consulted and be able to speak but maybe not have the powers given to the named person so that they in their own right would be able to to play a role that was I suppose one that they felt comfortable and able to do um, without I suppose encroaching on the rights of the service user but also um, not having to take on the full role of a named person. Um, that obviously gives different people different roles, but it might be in the best interest of the service user to have um, those different roles in play. Well, I mean, I suppose that, that that's the flip side of the point, isn't it, that I've, I've just made if we've, uh, and, and reflecting on uh, 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 this matter further, you, equally it could be the case that a carer or next of kin doesn't want to take on uh, the role as you have uh, um, uh, made the point. Um, so, uh, you know, in reflecting that, we'll we'll, we'll reflect on that s specific point uh, as well. In terms of, um, and I think it'd be understandable that unless there were uh, exceptional circumstances where uh, a carer next to kid uh, shouldn't be involved, I think it'd be understandable that they would want to continue to play uh, a role uh, in relation to. Uh, the, the, the service uh, uh, user. Uh, what I would say is that uh, the tribunal can hear from uh, persons of interest, and that would, of course, include a carer or uh, next of, of kin. Um, if uh, that wasn't felt to be uh, to cover the point that you're trying to make, Ms Grant, we can uh, look at the matter further, uh, of course, but I think essentially um, uh, the point is that such people can they continue to play a role in the process without being the named person. Okay. Yes, Dennis, you can have a supplement on it. Yeah, very briefly, Minister. Um, I'm just wondering sometimes if there, there there may be some degree of conflict. For instance, if the relationship, say, uh, between say the consultant um, psychiatrist and the members of the family are not good. 
and the patient is the, the named person is that next of kin, but the consultant feels it's not in the best interest of that patient to proceed to actually get a, a better outcome. Where do we stand uh, in terms of, do we go with the, the views of the consultant saying that the, the, the main barrier to sort of getting a positive outcome is that named person? Um, do we have a view on that, Minister? Uh, I might bring in uh, Carol in a, a second. I think I'm, I'll bring Carol in on, on that because I don't want to say something that might be incorrect. I, from reading <laughs> over the notes, I think I remember there is provision uh, about uh, 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 named persons, that the removal of, but I'll, I'll bring Carol in on that. I could be uh, wrong. I'll bring her in a second. But, I mean, clearly, you know, in such circumstances where there's a disagreement between uh, the qualified medical professional and uh, care on extra kin, that's very mm -hmm. unfortunate. We're relating to, if it's related to uh, how that interacts with the tribunal, then, of course, the tribunal will consider uh, these matters and come uh, to... Uh, its decision, and it also occurs to me that there is, uh, under the terms of uh, the bill, uh, an increased role uh, in terms of providing reports to tribunals for uh, um, mental health officers uh, where they uh, are uh, applicable. So, you know, that would be another uh, point of view that would be put in there as well. But obviously, the it's for the tribunal uh, to rule, taking into account all the evidence that's placed before it. Uh, Carol, I don't know if you want to comment on the points yeah, you've made. I, <clears throat> I think you've covered the, the main points there, uh, Minister, in terms of any sort of disagreements between both parties, if I can phrase it that way, will be fully explored at the tribunal hearing, and then the tribunal will reach a determination based on the evidence presented to it. Um, in relation to the removal of a named person, uh, the Minister's probably thinking of the provision that we have um, in the case of children who are under the age of 16, if they currently have a named person but it is felt that that named person is not acting in their best interests or is not carrying out the role, we have um, retained uh, or there is provision for the tribunal on the basis of evidence that's presented to it to remove that named person and then to appoint a more appropriate person and that would involve discussions with like the mental health officer etc. Um, with the new provisions going forward with someone only having a named person, if they wish to have a named person and with that, the person who's nominated to be the named person actually having to sign to say that they are content to take the role, then our view would be that there would be less opportunity uh, and less need therefore <coughs> for the tribunal to be stepping in and removing uh, a, a named person. Uh, that, that was the provision I was uh, thinking of. You know, um, what I would say, though, and I, maybe I should have made this point uh, before, you know, we would hope in such circumstances that any uh, disagreement, uh, any problems between uh, the medical protect practitioner and the carer or uh, uh, next kind of indeed wider family, we would hope that could uh, be resolved amicably before it got to that uh, stage. But, uh, uh, of course, there has to be provision in, in such, cir such circumstances. Thank you. Colin Keir. Uh, can be no, um, and good morning, Minister, and congratulations on your promotion. Uh, can I just carry on, uh, just before I come to question about the under-16 aspect um, of, uh, of the bill, uh, just along the lines of what was being talked about, but there's a, a note that we have here asking if, we, if any consideration was ever given uh, to the inclusion on McManus' recommendation 416 about the young, young person under the age of 16 who has adequate understanding of the consequences of appointing a named person should be able to do so. Was any consideration taken on that? Well, uh, can I, I say I think Mr Keir's congratulating him on my promotion uh, because we used to share an office, so he's finally got rid of me after uh, <laughs> uh, three years. Um, it, yeah, yes, I mean, th this is obviously uh, a, a matter that uh, has been uh, raised, but I would say... Uh, Whilst it is important to allow a young person to express a view on, on matters uh, which will directly impact them, it is, I think, equally uh, important to protect those who are most vulnerable. And it could be felt that uh, young, uh, uh, young, young people uh, in relation to this area uh, are uh, particularly uh, vulnerable. Uh, what I would say, uh, convener, is we're in the position where an overwhelming uh, majority of respondents to the Scottish Government's consultation 
on this bill didn't actually say anything in relation to this matter. So what I would say to uh, Mr Keir and to the, the committee as a whole, if uh, this is an area that the committee uh, wants to uh, make recommendations on or comment on uh, and at stage one report, we will uh, look at them uh, in detail. Can I? Colin? Yes. Sorry, I'm kind of trying to get through I'll the fight. I'll come back to you, you, you if you want me to come back. Um, no, <coughs> not on that particular issue. It was really, um, as it had been brought, the issue of 16 unders had been mm -hmm. brought up in another context. I thought I would uh, ask that in itself. Uh, could I just ask one more Certainly uh, question? Yep. Um, it's actually in terms of, I don't know if you've actually addressed this um, earlier, maybe you have, but in terms of the uh, nurse holding powers, the... Um, um, I may have missed something because I'm a bit clothier this morning. Um, and it was really in terms of the, the view of some, uh, such as Chair of the Mental Health Nursing Forum, uh, who was uh, saying that the proposals for allowing the nurse extension powers uh, effectively wouldn't work from what I can uh, gather. Maybe is there's any some comment you might be able to make on sure. that? Sure. Well, I think Mr Keir can rest these. I don't think we have explored that uh, uh, thus far. So, um, And in terms of uh, the, the comments that we made at committee, I, I, I don't... I'd need to look again, but I don't think the comment was quite as far to say that this provision wouldn't work. I think the question was whether or not it was felt to be uh, necessary. What I would say is, you know, I, I recognise of course that uh, the, there could be concerns that uh, the changes to the nurses at uh, home could be seen as a restriction of a service user's liberty. I think, though, I should make the point that uh, the government is very clear that the provision is up to three uh, hours. Uh, the code of practice that will be put in place will strongly uh, emphasise uh, that uh, the nurse must take all uh, reasonable steps to contact uh, a doctor and mental health officer right at the start of the period uh, and uh, equally hospital managers uh, should impress uh, upon their medical staff that they should make themselves available to examine the patient as soon uh, as uh, possible. I mean, I think I would also make the point that we would only expect the, the detention to last for as long as the period required uh, for the examination, that the full uh, three hours should only be uh, used if that is the time actually required for examination. And I would also make the point that there is provision under current powers, although it's a two-hour period, um, it can be extended uh, for an hour. Um, so if uh, that extension takes place right at the end of the two-hour period, it's more or less, it can be three hours uh, all, uh, already. Um, and I think um, you know, several stakeholders have already recognised uh, in uh, their uh, response to the Scottish Government's consultation that uh, this change should allow sufficient time for a, a medical examination to take place uh, and they were hopeful this could reduce the uh, necessity, the number of occasions in which uh, doctors have to apply for uh, what could potentially be unnecessary, uh, a 72-hour uh, emergency detention certificate in order to complete uh, the medical examination. That would obviously uh, be uh, of significantly more impact than uh, a three-hour uh, period. Again, I would make the point, you know, this is uh, driven uh, by uh, a, a desire uh, to uh, improve the experience for uh, the service uh, uh, user. You know, this change should uh, also help to uh, provide clarity for service users on the uh, maximum period of time for which they can be detained under the uh, nurse's holding power, rather than uh, you know it being felt just now it's two hours, but it could be extended uh, to up to to three, and it should also hopefully make clear that they are being detained for the purpose of enabling a medical examination to be carried out. Can I just uh, yeah. apologise for the fact I've misquoted? My memory is obviously not as good as the Minister's. He's perfectly right in saying the Chair of the Nurse, the Mental Health Nursing Forum, actually said no advantage in the extension. Yeah, they, they, they said there was no advantage. Yeah, uh, wasn't wasn't based in evidence. Yeah. Uh, it was. Um, it would impact on nurses' workload, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it, it was an idea that didn't come from nurses. Mm. Um, and the Mental Welfare Commission uh, in Scotland are opposing the move. 
So, so there is a, there is an issue there, not just for the committee. Yeah, just uh, thank the for not, uh, yeah. No, it no, you're properly. right, Colin. You're right. So on this th yeah, on this theme? particular specific right. issue. So, yeah. uh, I mean, the Mental Welfare Commission reports <coughs> that there were 177 occasions in which a nurse order was used, that on no occasion was there a doctor not attending within the prescribed time. Um, uh, but the m most interesting two things in that report were, first of all, the massive variation. A quarter of all the nurse orders were at the Royal Edinburgh Hospital. And that seems to me that th th there's something not right about the, about the nurse order's application as it presently is occurring. But the, the fact that the, uh, and the Mental Welfare Commission suggests that probably under reporting on the NR, the form, the appropriate form, the NR form. Um, so it seems to me that, you know, that we, we need a lot further detail on this and proper research done into what's actually happening. And we also need to see what's going to happen as a result of the Mental Welfare Commission's response to its own report, which was to issue new guidance on the application of the, the, the nurse uh, detention uh, system. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm minded with the, with the evidence that you've already heard from Colin Keir and quoted by the convener. Uh, you know, it would be certainly my view at the present moment in our stage one report to suggest that we should not proceed with this, uh, this change unless the government can come forward with convincing evidence um, that, the number of, that there are a number of occasions on which an emergency detention order was employed because of delays, which is what the minister has just suggested. And given that the number of emergency detention orders has dropped from over 3,000 to 1,000, you know, I, I would really like to see the evidence of when this is occurring before I was prepared to support this change, because it does involve a further small but nevertheless possible uh, period of detention. What, what I would say, and I take on board the points you make, I would say the Mental Health Commission's recent guidance will be uh, reviewing uh, the, the numbers here. I would also say just because you know numbers haven't, have dropped and uh, there might not have been in any uh, recently, the possi possibility is uh, still uh, uh, there that uh, uh, an emergency detention certificate could be utilised. I would make the point that um, I, you know, it's going from two to, to three hours. We're, we're not proposing, I think, something that is uh, drastic. We're not proposing uh, an extension from two hours to 24 hours or, or anything like that. Um, I would make the point again that right now the power is that it's two hours, but it can be extended by another hour. And if that happens towards the end, then essentially you're already dealing with potentially a three hour period. And again, and I think the most important point, and I'm sure Dr Simpson would uh, accept this as well, you know, this is up to three hours. We want to make sure that this is dealt with as uh, quickly as is possible. And I suppose we're dealing earlier about issues of accessibility in rural areas and the rest of it. I suppose when I said, I think it was with uh, Mr Robertson, I suppose uh, and we were discussing the extension from five to ten days in relation to another part of the bill, and I made the point that it may be other areas of the bill where it's, this is felt to be more uh, applicable in terms of uh, rural, rural areas and accessibility. I think there's, there's issues here in terms of um, making it, it, it easier in, in rural areas. But, you know, we'll take on board the points that you've made, Dr Simpson. We'll certainly look at them. Uh, and we want to, you know, we, want to, we don't want to do anything that is disproportionate uh, or felt to be absolutely unnecessary. We just think there could be some advantage in formalising the three-hour period instead of having it uh, as the possibility of it being extended. I, I go back to the, the point I made, you know, that might be felt not to be entirely clear to a service user. They could turn up there in the expectation it's two hours and then suddenly find that, well, actually, bang, it's extended to up to three hours, whereas uh, with this change they would be clear that it could be up to three hours from the, the outset. Thank you. Richard Lyle on the same subject. No, it's actually another subject. Oh, it's another subject. That's good. We're well, moving on okay, then. Okay, moving on. Um, something we actually haven't covered yet. Uh, the wider review of mental health and incapacity legislation. You made a, um, a statement earlier on that you're attending a conference tomorrow. Uh, at a recent party com conference I was actually uh, in discussion with Autism Rights. And Autism Rights and Psychiatric Rights Scotland have called for the removal of people with learning disabilities and autistic spectrum disorders from the mental health law. Inclusion Scotland also commented to that 
people with learning difficulties are concerned that they will be subject to compulsory treatment as a result of their learning disability alone. What consideration uh, have you given to removing people with learning disabilities and autistic spectrum disorders from the scope of mental health legislation? Can you advise me? Yeah, well, we touched on this earlier, of course, uh, convener. I think I made the point uh, that uh, you know I, I understand that this is uh, a view, um, uh, and you know uh, certainly bear cognizance of that being a, a view uh, out there. We don't have uh, plans to uh, remove uh, people with learning disabilities or autistic spectrum disorders from the uh, scope of the 2003 Act uh, at this stage. I think I made the point earlier in terms of um, it would be. It, certainly uh, the case that uh, even if they were removed uh, by virtue of uh, the specific uh, uh, issue of them having learning disability or autistic uh, spectrum disorder, they, they could still be encompassed within uh, this bill, uh, incapacity legislation, uh, adult support and protection legislation and new legislation, so it could be felt that that starts to, to complicate matters. But of course that in itself isn't necessarily an argument against these matters, and I, I make the point I made earlier, I will be happy to uh, maintain a, an open and ongoing dialogue with uh, the uh, representative bodies, um, uh, such as you have just uh, mentioned. I suspect you might have been talking about uh, a party conference I was at. I have to confess I did not have uh, that uh, a conversation at that time, but uh, certainly um, uh, I... Uh, uh, I mean, the, the First Minister has made the point that she wants this to be an accessible uh, government, so I'll certainly be uh, looking to play my uh, part in relation to my uh, portfolio and uh, I'll be happy to, to speak with the representative bodies in relation to this area. I, I'm, I'm sure the organisation who spoke to me will be very happy with those comments. I'm sure they will, and I look Thank forward you. to meeting them in due course. Thank you. Any other questions for the county? Richard Simpson. Yes, um, question of... Um, the um, degree of security, the extension to medium, sec uh, medium security unit, and that's very welcome, but uh, some of the evidence we heard suggested that should be extended to low security uh, units as well. And I just wonder if the Minister has any comment to make on that particular area, and also the extension to civil orders. Um, well, I, I certainly I think the first instance is this is an area that we have to obviously uh, legislate uh, on in terms of the provisions of the 2003 Act. Um, there was clear intent uh, that we, uh, as a, a parliament, uh, had uh, said there should be a right of appeal. Uh, the 2003 Act was framed at the time in that it talked of the need to be transferred to another hospital and I'm sure Dr Simpson will appreciate that, that actually doesn't reflect reality because in some uh, settings you could be just transferring from one part of a hospital to another which I think, I would hope the committee would agree that uh, is a lot better for a service user so in terms of the, the subordinate legislation um, that we would have liked to put in place it wasn't possible in uh, the scope of the way the primary legislation was it worded uh, uh, in 2003 and of course there has been a, a ruling at uh, the Supreme uh, Court so that uh, emphasises the need for uh, us to act uh, swiftly. I should also say and I want to be as transparent as I can uh, with uh, the committee uh, convener, um, there is a, a petition now before the Court of Session on these matters I think that is as much as I can say in relation to that matter for two reasons. It's about as much detail as I have at this stage and also uh, I don't want to fun fulfil of the presiding office in terms of uh, sub judice, but I just wanted to be uh, transparent with the committee to say that there is uh, a petition before the court of session and uh, uh, related to these matters. So clearly we have to uh, get this right this time and we're determined to do that. And I'm also aware, uh, convener, that uh, these are uh, affirmative uh, instruments so the committee will want to be able to uh, assess uh, their uh, efficacy as well. So that's another good reason for getting in place uh, early to allow uh, the uh, the uh, committee uh, time to properly uh, scrutinise uh, to scrutinise uh, the uh, the uh, provisions we put in place. In terms of the specific uh, point, uh, in terms of patients in low uh, secure settings, what I would say is 
the Scottish Government does not consider them necessarily t to be a problem with patients being held in uh, conditions, because this is about conditions of excessive security, that's what these provisions are related to. We're not convinced necessarily that uh, low security uh, falls into the gambit of excessive uh, security, particularly since uh, that the next step uh, uh, in progressing such patients uh, onwards from a low a secure setting would be uh, to uh, uh, get them back into uh, the community, which of course uh, is open to the tribunal to uh, order as part of uh, their ongoing uh, review procedures available uh, elsewhere in the 2003 Act. So I think essentially we're not necessarily convinced of the absolute necessity of extending it uh, beyond uh, the right to appeal to, uh, if you're in medium secure, to to low secure, but again, as with this is the point I've made, uh, and I don't apologise for making this point, Convener, because I, I'm very keen to hear what the committee has to say. If the committee cares to make recommendations uh, on this matter, we'll, we'll look closely at them. Thank you. Tessa, that minister will be your response to the Well, I'm aware of that. I could be making a rod for That'll be the test here. for you as a new minister. <laughs> is, there, is, is there any other questions? Uh, there's only one, I think, for me in, in respect to the, uh, the registration of uh, advanced statements in Section 21, which has been um, welcomed by the Mental Welfare Commission as a, you know, a modest and perfectly sensible proposal. But they, 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 they highlight, I think, um, uh, some of the evidence that we heard, and I think we all see it as uh, 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 making these statements when you're well, can, you know, should improve your experience when you're unwell. Uh, but there is a very slow take-up and has been a slow take-up of the, uh, these advanced statements. We've had some notions of that in, in terms of the evidence that, well, people don't listen to them anyway, they don't act on them. Is there any work that the government is doing to, uh, uh, you know, um, promote, uh, support and advocate these uh, advocate st statements as the Welfare <laughs> Commission says that <laughs> this provision in itself will not change the situation they're saying. Um, uh, has there any, be, any work discussions with uh, user groups about how we could do better in this area? Well, I've lost the coming to this news. I'm not quite clear on what discussion there, there has been. I suppose i go back to the point we will always be happy to have a dialogue. I should say, convener, convener, that we don't have any particular plans, any current plans to undertake specific uh, research on uh, the uh, the issue of it, it perhaps being felt that uh, there are, are, are barriers or the that uh, advanced statements are, are under uh, utilised. I, I do think they form an important part of uh, the process. What I would say is the creation of uh, a register of advanced statements to be held uh, by the Mental Welfare Commission will, I think, help in relation to this matter. It help provide some uh, data. Uh, on the number of uh, uh, advanced statements in Scotland and the geographic uh, spread or on a, an NHS uh, board uh, basis. So that will certainly help uh, build a better picture about how uh, widespread uh, they uh, are being used and we can certainly build up that uh, that picture on an ongoing basis and uh, if need be, respond to those uh, circumstances then. So I think certainly in the future we'll have a much better picture. Yeah, I'm sure you have some ideas for the future. Is there a historical position from your officials in terms of the advanced statements and, and how they're working or the, the slow uptake? Or? I think <clears throat> some of it is quite difficult. That the, um, having the register will, will help uh -huh. um, because you will have in, in one place, provided that the health board submits the copy, uh, we will then get a better picture because um, anecdotally some of the evidence is it's quite good in some areas, perhaps not uh, mm -hmm. in others. Um, there's probably some work we need to do around, there is a facility that what's in the advanced statement can be overridden. Now, uh, data that's provided by the Mental Welfare Commission shows that that happens in a very small number of cases, but some people think, well, what's the point in making a statement if it's going to be uh, overridden, so we probably need to get that message out uh, a bit better. I think there are also uh, reasons that you know we've got to remember. Whilst we recognise the, the good work that an advanced statement can do, if you're an individual who's been suffering from a, a mental health episode, as you're leaving the hospital, you probably don't really want to start thinking about well, what could I maybe put in place 
uh, if I'm ill again, um, because you like to think that you're not going to be ill again. So I think, along with some of the, the comments the Minister made around named persons, it is about just you know, sort of from the grassroots up, trying to, to build and raise awareness of mm. how effective a tool this, this can be. I suppose the, the point can here is, you know, that this is one of the reasons that we're, we're putting this provision in so that we can monitor the picture much better in, yes, in the future. I accept that. Uh, I was just, I, I noted, I don't know whether it was intentional or not, if the health boards provide... Well, the, the duty is on the health board and the, the provision... The duty now is on the health the board. The duty is on Clear the health duty. board. If Clear they are duty. available The, he to the health board them. are required to... Uh, the provisions in the bill require the health board to place a copy in the patient's records and, at the same time, a copy requires to be sent to the Mental Welfare Commission. And I think I'm, I'm remembering reflecting on the... Uh, the evidence sessions that you had, I think again this was a point that maybe the deputy convener, you know, this this can help improve the patient experience if right now they're not held centrally, if they're held only by the GP, what you need to access them quickly, what the GP is not available. So again this is this is driven by trying to improve the experience of the service user convener. If 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 you take note of what the vice convener on this committee says you'll not go far wrong, Minister. With him, at least. <laughs> anyway, that, that's not what you said pleasure, in the past. <laughs> it was a pleasure to have you and your team here today for the first time. We look forward to working happen. with you constructively in the future. Uh, thank you all very much for your evidence and your uh, time this morning. Thanks very much. We're now suspending uh, uh, for a short period of time to be set up for our, our panel. Thank you all for that.
We now uh, move to um, agenda item number four <laughs> and return to our early years inquiry, uh, which is one of our pieces of work under the health inequalities theme. Uh, we, today we have a, a round table of health professionals. Uh, and as normal, what we'll do in a, a round table to try and help promote a bit of discussion and whatever, but we will begin with introducing ourselves and just um, lay out the, the rules of engagement here that we're interested in hearing for our panellists who, who have been invited along today. And I will, from the chair, give peace on in in all occasions to our panel before the politicians that they come in. And just say that for some new new members. Of course, um, uh, you'll get an opportunity uh, as members to come in and, and keep the discussion going. But the, the, I'll look to the panel, um, I guess, uh, um, all, on all occasions. My name is Duncan McNeil. I'm the member of the Scottish Parliament for Greenock and Inverclyde and convener of the Health and Sport Committee. I'm Anne Mullen. I'm actually a GP from Govan in Glasgow. And I represent GPs at the Deep End organisation. Bob Doris, MSP for Glasgow and Deputy Convener of the Health Committee. Uh, my name is Jane Sellers. I'm a nurse team leader in Glasgow working with homeless families and also with um, uh, newly arrived asylum seekers. My profession is health visitor. And good morning. My name is Dennis Robertson. I'm the MSP for Aberdeenshire West. Uh, good morning. I'm Ron Gray. I'm a public health doctor in Glasgow and an associate professor at Oxford University. Good morning, Richard Lyle, MSP, Central Region. Hello, I'm Charles Saunders. Uh, in real life, I'm a consultant in public health medicine in Fife, and I'm also chairman of BMA Scotland's Public Health Committee. Uh, good morning, my name's Colin Keir, MSP for Edinburgh Western. I'm Nanette Milne, MSP for North East Scotland. I'm Lucy Reynolds. I'm also from Glasgow. I'm a paediatrician um, and I work in Postle Park in North Glasgow, but also cover quite a wide area, including East Dunbartonshire, so more affluent. I see kids with disability and developmental problems. And I also, for 10 years, worked as part of the maternal and child public health team in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And I'm representing the College of Paediatrics and Child Health. Mike McKenzie, MSP. I represent the Highlands and Islands region. Rhoda Grant, MSP for the Highlands and Islands. Teresa Fife, Director of the Royal College of Nursing. Uh, Richard Simpson, MSP Med Scotland and Fife. Thank you all for that. And I think just to set us off, um, uh, the Vice Convener, Bob Doris, is, uh, is going to um, you know, pose a question and I'll look for responses and see where that takes us. Um, thanks, Bob. Thanks, Convener. The Convener informed me about four minutes ago that I was asking the first question, but I'm, deli I'm, delighted, to, I'm delighted to do that. Um, I thought I might um, ask a general question, as the convener suggested. I, I listened with interest last week to the, 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 the statement by the First Minister in relation to the new legislative programme and policies. And one of the things that jumped out of me in relation to health inequalities was the fact that the government seeks to appoint a, a new independent advisor on poverty and inequality, um, which was of great interest to me. Now, I'm keen to know um, what progress you think has to be made in the Scottish Government um, promoting policies that tackle health inequalities. We've, of course, heard that a lot of the rooted aspects of health inequalities comes from income inequality. So there's a variety of policies not direct at the coal face with health care, but other wider policies which impact on the health and well-being of the people that we all, we all seek to represent. So some initial comments and maybe how you think that role could fit in with the, like, the public policy development that we're all involved in here and whether or not you believe the poverty impact assessment, which I believe is going to be ongoing with the Scottish Government, a new, a new initiative, should have a specific reference to health inequalities as well. Any responses? Theresa Feist, thanks for helping out the vice um, I'll there, break so. in then. Um, I think that anything that sets the agenda around poverty and sets out health and equality is a good message. I think that the work that people are trying to do is there, but so much of it can be invisible and not easily then documented and, and said, this is what happens. So impact is quite hard 
Though I was, I must admit, very pleased to see the research that came from Growing Up in Scotland, which talks about a couple of things that actually, within our own campaign around nursing at the edge, talks about that the most important thing is to actually get as close to the marginalised groups and also to be very aware of what impact you can have on individuals because too often we look at services for a whole and one of the things that out of inequalities for groups is understanding how individuals actually react to services and how the focus can be on them. I also think that you know what's very important when tackling inequalities for children which would be in there is to remember that it's actually the parents and the family is a big part of that so when you look at strategies for children not to look at them so for example work that's done around women who are offenders in prison who have children is a very important crucial part to looking at the child so they're just some of the things I would put as an opening but you're I think impact of policy and looking at that will be hard to do though so I'll be interested to see how they would set out what measures they would to be able to say they have made that impact because it isn't easy to do that. Anyone else? Yes, Dr Saunders. Yeah, from, um, from the BMA's point of view, if nowhere else, uh, we would say that the vast majority of inequalities in health, whether they be early years or later on, don't arise from health. Health picks up the consequences of, the, of those inequalities. The inequalities arise from the effects of government policies, both here and, and in the South, and also from uh, other government actions and, and actions within society. The, the so social determinants of health have far more effect on the health people have than the NHS ever will. We're just trying to pick up the, the consequences and minimise the adverse consequences on people's health that those inequalities cause. Yes, I, I mean, I think the, this committee, given the evidence that we've had, is, you know, we would accept generally that... that, that Although we wouldn't accept that there's significant mitigation that can be uh, a positive impact, but Bob, did you want to come uh, back? I suppose, I mean, to help, I, I was deliberately general. I mean, I, it's not for me to predict what witnesses might say in reply to questions, but there's a cluster of various policies I could ask in terms of of early years. I could ask how uh, Dr. Mullen thinks the the Deep End project and the link worker system helps helps those living in poverty and de deprived communities. We could be asking about the family nurse partnerships, we could be asking about proposals in child care and the balance between child care for uh, you know um, y children developing or as an economic necessity to allow work, uh, mothers and fathers to get into employment. Um, we could talk about living wage, but the whole cluster of the living wage policy of the Scottish Government. But I was trying to give a kind of wrap around test by which, when this committee is looking at how we tackle health inequalities, where where it sits. So, I mean, there's the opportunity, I suppose, for what this is to go. Look, here's something that we we think is working well and would like to be extended. Here's something we'd like to be changed, or here's an income maximisation policy that has to be pursued because we are trying to, as a committee, I think, given that it's reasonable to say. We think there's lots of good spends out there, but what we're trying to do is work out are we getting the best value for money in tackling health inequalities for the spends that we're putting forward. So, uh, I mean, if people want to come well, in on that, that was from uh, yeah. uh, Dr Reynolds. Yeah. It was just, um, just thinking about when you're saying... Um, I mean, I absolutely agree that uh, most of what we're picking up is the consequences of... of uh, um, uh, inequalities that then impact on health rather than health being the cause of the, the inequalities. But as health services, the last thing we want to do is to then exacerbate those inequalities by the way we structure our services. And so I would... If there is this post that's an advisor on poverty and inequality, if they could really deeply look into resource allocation models for how you fund uh, the services that are then picking up the, the, the difficulties. Um, I don't, working as a paediatrician, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of the barriers that we put up um, that are often in trying to be more efficient. Um, for instance, um, like if Anne were to refer a patient into a specialist service, um, with a lot of them, instead of just sending out an appointment, they will send a letter saying, please respond to this letter to, uh, in order to make an appointment so that it's kind of, oh, so it's only the people who are really motivated and will turn up for the appointments, will make the appointments, and we won't waste all these other appointments. But, of course, it's the most vulnerable people who don't 
they're under too much stress, whether it be financial or lack of sleep or mental health problems or whatever, to actually get round to phoning and making that appointment. Whereas if you just sent out the appointment in the first place, you know, it's that kind of, you know, sorry, that's going into a lot of detail for one example, but it's it's the kind of thing that you're meeting again and again. We're actually putting up barriers, and it's because we're trying to be more efficient. Um, and and I think the real uh, truth of how much extra time and effort it takes to engage with the the more vulnerable, whether it be socioeconomic uh, inequalities or whether it be disability or um, ethnic group or whatever, it, 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 I don't think our current formulae for calculating resource allocation really uh, hit the mark. Dr Mullen. Um, and, I, and I would agree with that. You know, working at the deep end, that we have to think about um, progressive universalism in services, but you can't really have that unless you've got realistic universalism. So if you, we are working in health and we're working in an area of high deprivation and we're all aware of the social determination of um, determinants of ill health, we still need the resource that we have to do to address the inverse care law, which is very uh, prominent in where we work, and that we need the resource to match the needs. Um, and part of that is through making the policies right, and some of the policies I think are very good, but it does come down to a lot of resource. And for instance, in our South CHP, we're having to lose 500,000 next financial year from our children and families budget. Now, you cannot run uh, realistic universalism with those scale of cuts. Um, and that is really one of the very real issues that we face. Anyone else? Theresa Faith? If I can come back to the point I was making, which was exactly that about access. Because in the work we've done around nursing at the edge, it's that she, my colleague in homelessness might want to comment, it's around that chaotic lives, that inability to actually, as you say, fit in with what we put in place as a service and how people can access. And one of the things that we're asking for is where there are services provided, that there's greater authority to reduce some of that bureaucratic um, you know, paperwork means that in fact may lose that person who's already made the effort to get there, made the contact, and actually then needs access to services, but have to go through quite a convoluted process and often don't return then. So those kind of one-stop places where they can get those services have worked very, very well for that reason. So access is a big word in there. And that's what I meant by the marginalised groups, because it's actually knowing where they are and who they are and understanding how you can actually go, go, go towards them. If you take that's what I meant by the women's offenders work that's been done in Perth, which was really focusing on those women and their children in a way that made them feel that even though they weren't in the community, they were receiving services as part of the community. And similar work up in Grampian within um, the prison work there as well. So it's looking for those. But the issue often is, and we're showing this in our, our, at our reception tomorrow night, is those projects sometimes are funded short term. And they're very dependent upon funding coming from a number of pots. And there's not a wish sometimes <coughs> to say, let's fund that and make it last long enough to show the impact of what it's doing. So I, you know, lots of people we meet talk about being waiting for a year to know, are they going to be funded for the next year? How do they stay that? And for health professionals to go into that role, it's a bit of a, it's, it's very risky if you step out of what is considered to be a good job and a safe job into these worlds. But most of them do it because they are really, really keen to make that difference. But they do it more often at the end of their career because they feel they can, they're more confident and more able to work within that. So for me, they're, they're some of the things that could be measured. If we don't change how we deliver the service, people will always fall between the, the, the footstools of what is there for those who know how to access it. I'm going to take Dr Gray first and then Dr Reynolds because Dr Gray hasn't been in. Dr Gray. Um, I just wanted to come back to your original pro, uh, you know, question about what do you ask um, that advisor to do? And I would say that that's a really, I mean, it's a great question because I've sort of seen um, in my career, you know, advisors, czars and all the rest of it come and go. And I'm never really sure to what um, effect, uh, particularly if they operate at a national level, because in my view, if you really want to make change, you have to do things at a local um, level. So I think if I were going to employ something like that, I would be looking at the evidence around what makes for an effective leader in those um, circumstances, and perhaps look at people like, I think, Al Ainsley Green is a good example of someone who did achieve something in the past, and maybe look at um, some of the things that he did to... Um, 
uh, to do that. I mean, I, I don't know the answers to what makes a good sort of um, commissioner, advisor, czar, but I'm sure there must be an evidence base out there. And I think, you know, you need to think the kind of person you want, what they might do, what they would require from you. Um, because, you know, uh, unless you kind of listen to them and act on what they do, then, they're, you know, they're going to be ineffective. And, you know, you could set somebody up to, you know, they could be there in an office effectively achieving nothing. So I think, you know, I would, before employing somebody like that, I would think very carefully about what I wanted them to do and how, how, how to make them most effective. Dr Reynolds. I was kind of going back that's okay, to that's is, and, and I'm sure it's something that's been said uh, probably again and again but but the importance of investing in generics at, you know like universal services that yes there are fabulous things to be learned from projects but I again and again see good people from you know local health visiting services going off and being seconded into projects and you just don't have the most vulnerable families really really benefit from continuity of care so having the same gp for years the mm -hmm. same health visitor for years etc and if they're all being broken up into to projects you just don't get that uh that continuity dr Moore. um i mean i think the joint workings bill and the children's bill has got great potential for this work to be developed um and i think they depend we think that the integration agenda is very important for this area of working because health and social care ne really need to work together much more closely and, and understand uh, each other's language and, and how, how we work together. And that, that relationship has been very fragmented for a number of years. So we have you know, developed a project that we hope will get funded because we feel that it addresses a lot of the issues that we feel um, as Practitioners are, are barriers to making uh, access to families better, the shared understanding, sharing of information, addressing the issues, addressing the inequalities. Um, and, and that project is really quite unique because it's being built up from the ground upwards. It's not coming from a top-down approach. But it does, need, uh, it does need support. It needs research report, uh, support. And we don't have that in general practice. We don't really have a lot of research that's well supported through the Chief Scientist's Office or, or core funding that's, that we can keep rolling on. You're talking about short-term funding for projects, and that is a real anxiety about all these kind of pilots, etc. You know, where do you get the good evidence, the good evaluation that you can that has international connotations as well as local ones and national ones? So I, I think that's something that we would... Um, advocate for in the deep end as well. Yes, Dr Gray. Can I just come back on this? It's slightly changing the subject, but I want to pick up on that last point. Um, I've just come back to Glasgow after 12 years away, and there's been sort of massive changes in policy, and, and things are an awful lot better, and I think in general across Scotland than they were, say, 12 years ago. But I think what's still lacking is this culture of evaluation, um, and I think, you know, there's so many different pilots on child obesity, on uh, parenting and so on. Yeah. And I think sometimes these things get started and people sometimes say, well, you know, which of these are effective and how effective are they? And frankly, we don't know because um, there's not enough um, resource put into evaluation at the same time as these things are commissioned. So I think they need to be longer term and scale. But I think that needs to, that they need to have um, evaluation built into that. And I think that needs to be part of the um, setup moving into integration. There's lots of stuff that health and social services could do together, for example, on looked after children who are a really marginalised group who form a lot yep. of the prison population and so on. Will they do that? Well, I think it depends if they're prepared to share information so that we can actually look to see what outcomes there are across the, 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 the piece. And again, with education as well, if that's possible. But unless we can bring all that together, then we can set up all these projects and we'll never really have any idea if we're making any difference or not. Yeah. Can I, can I test some of that? Then? You know, I mean, we, we are here under the general banner of looking at child poverty. And we see it every day of the week. That it almost becomes meaningless to people. Uh, Professor Marmot made the point, you know, that... Uh, you know, the, being in poverty is defined as having an income of less than sixty percent of medium income, and it's likely, and it's unlikely that that a country would have a distribution of zero, no child poverty. The country with the lowest levels are Norway, where there's ten percent child poverty because we use that measurement. And we have heard, heard evidence in the past that because you're dealing with that situation and almost hiding these very vulnerable by ethnic background or, or um, uh, children coming out of care, 
you know, so you're almost blurring the edges and losing the focus because you're dealing with that generality. And governments do it as well. We're all very hot at this point. And so the one question is how we measure it. Should we, should we have a greater focus on what we're, what we're tackling and therefore a, a, a greater chance of dealing with uh, those very vulnerable groups? The other one is about what government do. We're all very hot that the living wage is going to, serve, you know, going to solve poverty at the, at the moment of time. The whole lot of us are all rushing to the living wage. It doesn't, me doesn't measure at all household income. It can actually, in some cases, not reduce poverty, but increase the gap between the less well-off and the better-off. The lack of clear objectives of government policies, whether that well understood inverse care law can be applied to education, the economy, and everything else. You know, so the, the, I don't know whether there was a there is a question in there. Do we need to do we need to understand as politicians what we're actually talking about? Do we need to evaluate it? Do we need to do better uh, uh, in ensuring that the measures that we take as politicians actually do the job they say they're going to do? Because currently, I don't think that they're achieving those ends when, when, when the gap between rich and poor has been growing despite all of the well-intentioned uh, policies from all shades of government right across the board. Anyway, I throw that in there to see if we can warm this up. But anyway, any takers? Dr Mullen and then Dr Gray. Well, I mean, Sorry. No. <laughs> Dr Atkinson, who's a Children's Commission in England last year, wrote a very interesting report, um, and you can all read it, it's online, about um, the, the effect of welfare reform on uh, children, and, and uh, wrote it from a children's rights perspective, which is a very interesting way to look at the uh, welfare cuts and how it affects families and poor child outcomes, etc. So anything that you do is undermining your uh, rights of the child and the legislation you've signed up to. Um, you're opening yourself up. She put that as a very interesting question. The government is in danger of breaching its own children's rights policies um, that it has signed up to, which is an international agreement, because of the, the retrogression uh, and the nature of the policies that are discriminatory they really affect the poorest children. Mm -hmm. So that's the sort of thing as government I think you have to try and... Um, how are you going to address that then? Because, because we are creating inequalities through a number of policies that are making the gap wider. And it's poor children that are being disproportionately affected rather than uh, other children. Dr Gray? Um, well, I think that's right about poverty, but I think you've also got to think about the other side of the equation as well, and that's wealth. I mean, what's really perpetuating these uh, inequalities is not just people staying in poverty, it's people getting tremendously wealthy. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of literature on this. I'm sure you've seen as politicians, Thomas Pinkerty's written a... A, a, a book on this and various other um, people talking about um, this huge increase in wealth um, in a certain group in society, which is fueling the inequalities as much as um, you know, uh, it, it, you know, pro problems at the other end. And um, I mean, it seems that one of the ways that the problems are mediated is through lack of opportunities for education, right? And really, although we're talking about health inequalities, I mean. Education is one of the single most important things, and we know from figures from Glasgow and elsewhere that um, you know poor children are beginning to fall behind, um, you know, by two or three years old in terms of liter you know early literacy vocabulary and so on. And the fact is that even with the best well-intentioned early childhood programmes, um, you know, and they are effective, and they are cost-effective, they still do not completely make up for poverty. I mean, you know, I, I was looking at something recently suggested that the effect of, of two years in preschool might reduce the effects of poverty by about a quarter on various outcomes, but that's all. So really, to some extent, you do need to tackle poverty at root, but you also need to tackle um, increasing uh, wealth. Dr Reynolds. Um, yeah, I'd like to pick, on, pick up on that because the... You know, after the UNICEF uh, report in 2007 on the well-being of uh, uh, children in 21 OECD countries where the UK came bottom, and then U UNICEF UK followed that up with research looking um, uh, in more detail comparing, uh, well, 
travel being in the UK with Spain and with Sweden, and um, particularly looking at uh, the impact of inequality and of materialism. So picking up on what Ron's saying about there's a problem with, you know, it's the inequality, the fact that there is so much perceived wealth as well. That I mean, that, that report, one of the um, recommendations of that report uh, was to ban advertising to uh, directed at children. So this is not just... Um, you know, unhealthy foods, or I think it's just all uh, advertising directed at, ch at children. When I, if I come down to a single kind of thing that I'd like to change in order to be able to uh, improve health and well-being of children, it's reducing stresses on parents. That's yes, the stresses of poverty, the stresses of poor housing, the stresses of um, trying to maintain their, their 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 job, problems with childcare, whatever. But uh, advertising materialism puts additional stresses on on parents, and and what they found in you know in the in the UK was that the the more affluent parents who were um, uh, rather time poor, they were working really hard, uh, and then because they felt guilty that they weren't uh, spending enough time with their kids, they were then buying them expensive things. Whereas the poorer families were feeling a real stress that if their child didn't have Nike trainers, they'd be bullied. Um, and, you know, I've had, had patients who have failed to turn up for an appointment. Um, you know, the mum hasn't brought, brought the child. I've phoned the mum on the mobile, and she's Christmas shopping because she thinks it's more important that the child gets some flashy piece of plastic instead of... Um, in, instead of seeing the paediatrician yeah. um that you know we've got a culture where people queue up overnight to get the latest electronic uh <coughs> gadget um and that is a factor of this inequality the fact that there is the perceived wealth and then the people who don't have the wealth are trying desperately or feeling stressed that they're not uh getting the, the, those things um and that uh uh they're therefore maybe not spending their money on, and that sounds terribly patronising, but on, on things that would be uh, more appropriate. You can't... I mean, I, I don't know that you can actually ban uh, advertising uh, to children because uh, our borders are so porous that, you know, even if we did it in Scotland, they'd be uh, accessing it other ways. But it would be a good message that we're a child-centred uh, nation, that we care about our children if we did something like that. But I think more importantly, it's building resilience so that people don't feel so impacted on by that, the inequality and the materialism. And There, they... were, there was some, some of that touched on, I think, and we looked at my committee members, that you know, from Harry Burns about the differences right. between... Oh, I'm glad he and I agree. Be, yes. Between, between <laughs> um, you know, uh, the, the Glasgow situation and maybe down south, and he, he, he highlighted that the lack of compassion in our society now. Um, people in Glasgow are less likely to trust their neighbour, less likely to be, you know, having these discussions. You know, so, so, so we've, we've, we've got that. How do we, how do we I mean, go back to my original figures? If we're just generalising the problem, how do, how do how, how we measure and how we communicate this problem to some effect is, you know, to me of some importance, at least in health. Now, I'm not saying that that's the right measurements, but at least in health, the only portfolio we measure inequality in terms of smoking, early birth weight, mortality, whatever, whatever. There is no other measure in any other portfolio. Now, I suppose the question is, is that the right way to measure this inequality in health stats? Or is there other measurements that could be applied to other portfolios that would actually, you know, you know, communicate this problem more effectively? We've almost, you know, yes. And then Dr. Saunders. Yes, Dr. Dr. Reynolds. There is. Um, for me, it's much easier for me to uh, pull data to illustrate inequalities uh, in whether it's what we deliver or what uh, or, or outcomes uh, for children according to their the Scottish index of multiple deprivation so you know the, the, the deprivation of their of the postcode sector mm. where they live than to demonstrate it by anything else so in a way I'm kind of yeah there could be better um, uh, there could be other ways of measuring it but at least I we have a measure and we can report, whereas there's it, so many families, there's clustering of risk, there's um, there may be disability, you know, the, childhood disability is more common the more deprived a, a population. Uh, <coughs> if they've got childhood disability, there's more likely to be adult disability in, in the family. Um, the, 
ethnic minorities, asylum seekers, more likely to be poor, etc. But we, and we've touched on looked after and accommodated children as well, but you can't pull any data on our routine um, uh, delivery of services according to a child's disability status. We don't even know how to record a child's disability status. We haven't even decided what a definition of disability is. We, we're, we're not recording ethnicity well. Um, uh, yeah, I could do it by, by gender. I can do it by age, and I can do it by Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. So at least we've something for poverty, whereas the other risks that are clustering in these families, we're not measuring. Dr Saunders. There's a number of generalisable things that need to be done, that we've known for decades need to be done and haven't addressed. There's, as we've said earlier, you know, there's parental employment, parental income, there's nutrition from the woman before she becomes pregnant, through pregnancy, after pregnancy, of the family, where we still, we know exactly what food we would like people to be eating, but by and large, a lot of the people who are most deprived don't get to eat that, either because it's too expensive, or because it's not available, or because they know if they buy it and they feed it to their family and their family won't eat it, they haven't got the money to replace it. The socialisation of children that we significantly fail to achieve, uh, it, particularly in, term, in, in very deprived areas in terms of being able to even just play outside in a safe way, it, it's not feasible. Large parts of Scotland are very rural and the deprivation data doesn't actually show rural deprivation terribly well and it's quite easy for pockets of rural deprivation to be hidden amongst relatively less deprived areas and just not appear in the statistics. One of my colleagues mm -hmm. at work has a particular interest in that. He spent a large amount of time showing to his own and other people's satisfaction that the data we currently collect misses a lot of people who are de deprived in rural areas. And there is no simple way around that to, to, to dig those data out. But I, I, I would go back to, we, we actually need uh, across government to try and bring everybody up while also trying to focus on those who are the most deprived. I mean, some of the uh, initiatives that have been set up are working very well. There's Child Smile that I'm, I'm sure you're aware of with, with dental health, where the decayed, missing, and filled um, numbers in children of, of, of all uh, categories, but particularly the most deprived. Are, are, are being addressed and dealt with and their dental health has improved immeasurably. There are other programmes that are working particularly <coughs> well, the Family Nurse Partnership for example, but that's restricted to women under 20. You know, the people over 20 who, who, who need that service don't get it. The, the, there are other programmes in place which again have time limited funding uh, and some of them finish next year, and we have no idea yet whether that funding will be continued. But th there's a lot of joined up thinking needed from, the, as I said, the more generalizable things that will help all children, whether, you know, whatever the de degree of relative deprivation, and the specific issues for the most deprived that do need long term funding I in order to actually work well. I mean, to go back to Child Smile, that does have long term funding, and I'd say its future is pretty well. Uh, established, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of other programmes that need that sort of certainty in order to be able to achieve the same things. Three to five. I think there's a common theme coming through, which has been said by a number of people, is that we we're not we're not very good at knowing what data we have and how we use it. We don't. We also have a gap in the research evidence. That's why I mentioned the growing <coughs> up in Scotland research was good to see. But there isn't actually a body of research that would enable people to know what's the best impact, which is why I made the point earlier, how you measure <coughs> impact. You need to have an evidence base that helps you understand <coughs> what the efficacy is and what you can do. And I would support Charles around the Child Smile programme because that's one of the ones that really dem has demonstrated a significant drop. So what's gone right in that and why did it get actually long-term funding? What did it do to succeed with that when other projects get short-term funding and are not sure. <coughs> and I don't believe at the very beginning they do enough about the evaluation. And with Family Nurse Partnership, it's, it's been shown as an evidence base to say it works. But right now, my position would be as a Royal College of Nursing, I'd right, want to see the impact of that very 
focused expense research on a targeted group, which leaves others out, does it really achieve that? Will it make that difference to support that? Because one of the areas that we've been looking at is where, for example, with health visitors, where they would wish to maybe provide more specialised services on top of what they do with their ordinary day is quite hard to do. It's a very hard case to make. So the work they did in Grampian around the prisons came from a wish by the teams up there to do something different. It wasn't coming from this is the goal that we need to do. So I think if I go back to your point um, um, about what the advisor needs to do is actually have some clear goals that cross all government and hold people to account. And when the Children's and Young People Bill was, was, a, was, was under consultation, we were one of the groups that felt there should have been more about actually the rights-based approach to children. And it has got a duty on ministers to demonstrate how they're going to do that. And I, that's where I think um, Anne Mullen's point's been around where they will be challenged. How are they going to do that? What activity are they doing to demonstrate that they have taken a more rights-based approach? We, as an organisation, believed that should have been more embedded in that, in that legislation and thereby would require those activities to be more across government and in order to get a more, as I say, con it's a constant approach. We, we've said that already. Continuity with who's providing the care, but a constant approach to those services that will take years to make the difference. We know that. We know it's not going to by a couple of years. We know it's going to take a long time. If you want an intergenerational shift, you're going to have to work at it for quite some time. But at the end, know what difference that's made and what difference it hasn't made and what more can you do. Anyone else? Committee member Dennis Robertson, how are uh, uh, thank you, Kavir. Maybe just picking on that point, I, I'm just wondering, uh, and it's a point that uh, I think Dr Saunders and Dr Faye made as well, um, some of the foundations, I think, have been laid. If we look at getting it right for every child, you know, the GIFRAC, and we look at the curriculum for excellence, you mentioned education, Dr Faye. Some of these initiatives that are there, do you think that these are the foundations for starting to move in the right direction? But what we're requiring, and it's a point you were just making, it's a behavioural and cultural change, which will take uh, quite a number of years. And I'm just wondering if the role in schools, we, we, we've seen a, a tremendous change in the role of school nurses, for instance. But I'm wondering, you know, is it school nurses we need or is it maybe health visitors within schools, um, initiatives like that? Um, so I'm just wondering if we're getting the foundations right and we're just taking a while to, to start building on it. Any takers? Dr Gray. Uh, well, I think we know quite a lot of the things that we should do, and Michael Marmot's kind of listed out a number of the interventions, and I think, you know, they start off in the antenatal period, you know, um, thinking around um, alcohol, drugs, smoking during pregnancy, stress, and so on and then going on to breastfeeding and uh, uh, weaning and so on, and then um, on to parenting, early education and so on. I think we know all these things. The issue for me is that um, it's really kind of joined up, and it's very rarely that we see, although we have um, you know, evidence for a number of these things, what you often don't see is, is local evidence um, of, of um, e effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Because... Um, I mean, we need to know a number of things. We need to know not just if they work, but how well they work and what kind of size of effect we get from them. We need to know if the people who need them are really getting them, you know, the reach of the intervention, if you like, to get into the right people. And then are these things actually being implemented properly on the ground? Because sometimes they're not. Sometimes, with the best will in the world, people don't implement things properly and, um, you know, they, 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 they therefore have no effect. And I, I think for a lot of things we just don't know that kind of detail and the only way we can ever get that is by getting you know our data system such that we can look at that and we can look at a broad series of outcomes across health education um, and social care and I think you know something you alluded to earlier looking at maybe positive outcomes as well as negative ones like you might want to look at things like happiness aspiration quality of life for children mm -hmm. Um, you know, if we look, you know, how, how does aspiration look in um, the, the, the lowest um, uh, quintile of deprivation as opposed to the, 
the, the, the highest highest one and you know that would give us information I think we could we could start to, to act on and we could start to see whether we're being effective or not. Anyone else? Okay. She's too mean, polite and nudging <laughs> me in the ribs and I'm always looking out this way. <laughs> Dr Mullen um, and then <laughs> think, Dr Reynolds. I think that's that's right. The, 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 we need to know what we're measuring and how we're going to measure it and what evidence. And, and we do lack a research base, uh, particularly in primary care, that can cuts across all the disciplines and see what we're actually doing. Because despite the strategies and everything, the work goes on at the front line and, and we deal with the consequences and the pressures on budgets and the lack of resource. And we have to somehow try and muddle our way through all of that. And, you know, primary care, general practitioners particularly, are a universally accessible, unconditionally accessible service. So we are a useful uh, contributor to this debate, and yet it's only 3% of our contract is really to do with child health, really, in some respects. It's given uh, very little attention, uh, and yet we do a lot of paediatrics and general paediatrics and general practice. Um, and our relationship with health visiting is extremely important in, in the early years as well. And there's also very good things in education. The nurturing corners and nurseries are very good. And the two programmes that do have evidence base that are unassailable it is the Family Nurse Partnership and the Credible Years. The rest of them have some promise. Uh, Triple P has been slightly controversial. So um, <clears throat> we don't have much to go on. And, and actually what we're asking from the front line is, is uh, you know, realistic universalism so we can have progressive universalism. There's no point having specialist services for, for children and families who are vulnerable if you can't actually get the rest of it right. And, and this is the problem, I think, that, you know, that we have at the moment. What, what, what's your definition? I mean, we've had, heard this before, universalism plus uh, realistic universalism. What, what, is your, what is your definition of realistic universalism? <coughs> I mean, I, I think that we, you know, from the GP's point of view, um, working in the deep end, we understand we need more time <coughs> to, to provide the service that we need. And, and there's been Stuart Mercer's work on the Care Plus study, sort of estimating how much more time GPs need. And I'm, I'm not here to just talk about general practice, obviously, but because of other services under the same sort of pressures. But unless we have realistic times to see people deal with the problems, and actually what the government project is trying to do is address that. Um, the links does another aspect of that work, which is very good and is going to be properly evaluated. Unless we have that time, though, and it can be flexible, you know, there's mm. a flexibility there as yeah. well, then we, we aren't going to do the work that is needed. Is it, it's is an it, unmet need. Is it all though, the a time. challenge to, to, you know, not a challenge, but, but you know, a mm. debating point with uh, Dr. Saunders, who, who says everybody needs to move up? Because, you know, I think one of the problems, at, in my you know, humble opinion, that we've got is that as everybody moves up, we don't address the gap. The gap's frozen in time. Everything we add on, none of it reduces the gap. Well, the, I mean, there's Danny Dorling who talks about the 1%, isn't there? Sorry, in that, that top 1%, that inequalities gap, and even the gap in there is massive. Mm -hmm. um, and unless that's sorted, but that's an international agenda. Again, it's, you have to do something with capitalism, I think. But meanwhile, we can still work with the inequalities that we have and, and do positive things about yep. it. Jane Sellers, and I'm, I'm going to give uh, Dr Saunders a, a, an opportunity to come back, but Jane hasn't been in, uh, so... Um, I think just, just from a practical point of view, thinking about what um, universalism means to me as a practitioner on the ground being a health visitor it means that every single child has a health visitor who is accessible to them and, and is able to that health visitor is able to use their sort of professional judgment about um, how much time a family needs some will need less at, at differing times and some will need considerably more and access um, and ability to have that help us to facilitate access to, to specialist services that might be necessary. And I think that acceptability of everybody in an area, every child has a health visitor, no matter who they are and no matter where they sit on the, on the socioeconomic spectrum is, is, is what I think I mean by universalism and allowing the health visitors to make that professional judgment about about who they see and how they do that. And just um, your point, Mr. Robertson, about school nursing. I think school nursing, we have very few school nurses, particularly um, in Glasgow. And from my point of view, in terms of being able to look at the, the broader aspects of, of health and well-being for school-age children, aside from their education and their pastoral care that they get within school, the the 
um, capacity for school nurses to do any of that work, I think, is is absolutely minimal. Once they've de delivered the um, immunisation programmes and those things, they have absolutely no capacity to do any of the other work. And I think we need health visitors to specialise in the in the preschool years, in in that aspect of, of health and development, and we need school nurses to be able to do not only the <coughs> immunisation but to do that wider support work for families in the in the in the school age years. Yeah. Do you see a role for the health minister within the school as well as out in the community though? Um, not necessarily because I think school nurses as a profession are well able to deliver um, what health visitors deliver in the in the in the pre in the preschool years. Okay. But it, you know that aspiration it avoids us dealing with the issue about transferring resources, isn't it? The better off, the better educated, the more articulate, get a disproportionate amount of, or maybe a fair amount, and in comparison to poorer people, they get a bigger share of the health budget, they get a bigger <laughs> share of the education budget, they get a better share of the jobs, they get better pensions, they get, you know, so, is it time to be tackling some, maybe Dr Saunders, you, you, you are everybody moving up and, uh, the, the, the challenge is that the gap doesn't get any narrower. Well, I, I think everybody does need to move up. It's just some need to move up slightly more than others. Um, you know, the, the, the whole of, of uh, society and children in Scotland do need to improve their health. Some of them have a desperate need to improve it more than others, but everybody needs to be moved up. And I certainly take very much on board what my colleague said about school nursing. The school nursing service has been very largely subsumed into, into delivering immunisation in schools in recent years, and there's very little time left over for anything else. Uh, if I could just make one other very brief point. Um, currently, from a sort of population perspective, the directors of public health at health board level have that responsibility, and a very large part of their job is to bring up the population health aspect and inequalities in health and deprivation to health boards. I in future, new appointments as directors of public health won't be executive directors of NHS boards and will lose a great deal of authority within the NHS board on that. And in relation to the health and social care partnerships, again, the directors of public health will have no formal role there. And I, I, while the, putting together health and social <coughs> care would seem to be intuitively a good idea, taking out the... the person who has had historic responsibility for the population health, that's the Director of Public Health, which I'm not one, um, but, but taking them out doesn't seem to be a sensible step when, as we're all aware, the inequalities in health, and particularly in the early years in Scotland, are increasing. Theresa Fife, and then I've got Dr Reynolds, and I see a bid from Nanette Mellon. Thank you. Um, Going back to the point made about actually how you have your universal service and how you understand how you respond to deprivation. So, for example, for health visitors, they're trying a new tool at the moment that at least might assess the workload and take into account social deprivation because before this tool came along, there was no means of doing that. So your caseload could be very high but could be extremely demanding because of actually increased deprivation in some parts. So we had um, health visitors who had a different caseload within some parts of Scotland to others just down the road from them because of deprivation. So we're trying to find a measure that at least says this is what you need in response to that, or otherwise you don't... There's no doubt about it that no matter what an, an individual practitioner will do, the demand comes from those often who make the most to you and who require more, which is you're more articulate, and often then miss the very people that you're trying to get near... School nursing is unfortunate because um, it has been hijacked by a need, and don't get me wrong, there was a need for immunisation. So when that came along, everyone said, well, that's actually what school nurses can do, but forgot that they were meant to have other functions within that, and they have been totally consumed. And unfortunately, in some areas, they have been reduced. So even though there's been an emphasis on that within schools, school nurses have actually not increased in number. In fact, in some areas in Scotland, they've <coughs> decreased in number. So that's, you know, again, a measure... But I come, I come back to the point, though, about I think what they were saying earlier, and others have said it, is that if we don't find a way of joining up all these policies and being clear, because one of the risks we've got is lots of policies 
again, I go, keep coming back to impact and not knowing what impact they're meant to have for children and really and truly understanding whether those policies connect. And my final point is around integration of health and social care. It's, as you know, we've been here in front of you with the evidence we gave around the move to that, very supportive of a move to integration of health and social care, but we are going to have to keep a very, very close eye on as partnerships work and as they look at what they believe the services are to be, how they will ensure that continuity. Because you've got areas where you have several partnerships and, you know, how you get, for example, Glasgow, for example, is going to have a number of partnerships, how you're going to actually ensure that you have a cross-Glasgow approach to some of these very issues. It's not impossible to do, but it will be challenging. And I think that that's at a time in the next couple of years you need to keep a, an eye that the very things that we're talking about, because they are the more expensive and they demand a very different type of resource, actually get shortchanged during that period. Um, and that would be a concern. Thank you. Dr Reynolds. Um, so uh, the um, <coughs> universalism, I would agree absolutely how crucial health visitors uh, are um, in being universal and proactively going out to seek patients whereas I mean GPs are also highly important but they're not going out into the home to find to find families um, and so in identifying the increased level of need health visitors are absolutely crucial for the people who aren't going to necessarily present themselves and so of course really welcome in, increased investment in, in health visiting and health visiting that health visitors being the named person of course, I work a lot with school nurses. I wish there were more. But at the same time, we've got to remember that under GERFEC, once the child's in school, education provide the named person uh, role. So we, we've got to be thinking about how we're supporting them and not thinking, oh, you know, well, we've just got to recreate health visitors for school because because that's, you know, children, once they're in school every day, the people who are providing their education will have a much better idea of the child and hopefully form relationships with the family as well. Um, but also the, the, those, the, it's important, and, and the, the Shinari, you know, the safe, healthy, active, respected, responsible, that, 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 those indicators, um, they're, they're just pretty much from the UN Convention, the rights of the child. You know, wherever you work, whether, whether in other parts of the UK, or whatever, they'll have similar kind of well-being uh, out, outcomes that they're, they're aiming toward. We should be thinking of those not just on an individual basis. We should be thinking of those at population level. What are we doing to make our children safe, healthy, achieving, active, etc.? Um, and those health visitors or, or, or professionals <coughs> in a local area should be able to be building up, like what Anne's saying about bottom-up um, uh, uh, initiative in, in, in Govan. Um, there's also initiatives, um, there's the Richer Project in Vancouver, where they uh, put additional resource in having um, identified which areas at a population scale were more needy, given the, um, the early development in, index, the EDI scores for their, their population, and made services more accessible. Because, going back to what I was saying at the very beginning, to do those assessments... Um, of uh, of need to put to um, to support families. Um, the more complex uh, the um, the circumstances, the more time uh, the professionals are going to need. And then overall, in building up that population view, it's it's all about raising the status of uh, of of children and supporting the GPs and the health visitors on the front line by having easily accessible services. The more you know, when there are like paediatricians, more specialist services that were accessible for the consultation and advocation at, at advocacy at the population level as well as for um, managing individual children. So I feel I get quite, I've got so many Absolutely things to say, good. I get them all good rather jumbled up together. That's okay. I'm better on That's paper. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Your passion came through. Um, as no other panel members, I'm just going to move to Nanette for a, another Did question. You, Nanette. follow up with, with Jane Sellers. I think you mentioned about perhaps health visitors specialising. I mean, I, I have experience in my husband's former practice, which was a mixed practice. It was you know, some deprivation, but not, obviously not, not entirely. And I, I remember years back the, the real efficacy of practice-based health visitors and I, I think when, when that then went into a more community role it, I didn't think it was so effective I just wonder what your comments are, are on that and you think that health visitor, visitors are better based within practices or within groups of practices or how do you see the best way forward 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's. I mean, I've always worked as um, prior to this role in homelessness as a, an attached health visitor to a practice, and I think it's a, a very reasonable way to for health visitors to work, and it and it promotes a really good relationship with the GPs, and um, is, is a good identifier of of the people within that within that local area. Um, I think when there was an attempt to sort of you know that more sort of public health agenda around health visiting a number of years ago and i think what we lost there was that some of that ability to direct contact with families and i don't think there is anything that can um anything that can, can come close to those home visits that you do with families on a regular basis i think developing a relationship with a family um and seeing you know how they live their lives and and trying to support the best way that they can they can live the lives that they want to to live particularly for their children and for us to be able to facilitate with the gp and the other services that that locate around that hub of a gp practice i think are probably an ideal way for health visitors to work to, to, to carry that out would it would it require a lot more health visitors or not um i'm not sure whether it would require a lot I mean, maybe it would, because I think to be able to do that, you need lower caseloads, mm -hmm. particularly in city areas, in areas of high deprivation. I mean, I've never worked in a rural area, but presumably in terms mm -hmm. of rural areas, it's, it's less about numbers and it's more about spread and, and time and um, travel, time, travel <laughs> time and things like that. But it's, that's, that's not an experience I've ever had. I worked in Liverpool, as you might have been able to tell, and I've, I've worked in Glasgow. Um, so yeah, I think and for health visitors to be able to work their caseload and and really offer those home visits not only to those people who can demand it because of their you know their ability to demand services you know because of their articulate and and everything else, but also to be able to give because they they have needs as well as as those more um, um, vulnerable people, I think. To, to be able to do that and to address some of the community work, some of the, the sort of um, very localised groups that we can that we can um, offer to people on the ground, you do need you, you need smaller caseloads. <coughs> Theresa Fife wants to come in on that one. Yeah, I, think that's, uh, I do understand they're looking back at the attached model to say that might work, but our world has changed and <coughs> the way services are provided. We would say the word aligned. You have to have the team model working but I don't I've never agreed that everyone has to be within the same place with the same filing cabinets and the same processes because the way services are now are going to be you could never fit it always within wherever GP practice is but absolutely aligned absolutely working together and sharing and that's where e-health improved technology can enable people to do that some places have done something very different within their community um, because they've used a, a building they've had, a, a hospital, they've turned into something bigger, and they've been able to actually have everybody together because they've had the premises to do that. But I, in my own local area, when I talked to them, they couldn't fit anybody more in there um, in order to do that. So I think we need to be careful to think that worked, but what we need to do is be absolutely clear where those teams work together. And that's not just, obviously, health visitors and actually share that working and that intelligence and doing that, that can still be achieved without everybody actually believing they have to be in the same place. I um, used to think that model, but I must admit, I've seen lots of places now, and not just health visitors, where people are better working at team working rather than saying they have to be within that, and that's what we should be promoting. Anyone? Yes, Jane? Just, just to, to um, agree with Theresa there, I think, I think that... that you know, my experience has been in years gone by where we had health visitors working in cupboards and things in GP surgeries. I do think we have we've moved on considerably from that. And I suppose what I was meaning really was what Teresa alluded to, and it's about relationships and sort of hubs and wherever that wherever that hub is 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 where I think the health visitor should be. Um, <laughs> I do I do yes. agree about the teamwork. <laughs> 
it helps us to our forming relationships with a lot of other people, not just GPs. Um, uh, so that the importance, I mean, Jane or one of her team might phone me, um, you know, about a child with who, who's from one of the homeless families and who has um, developmental or, or di problems or disability. Um, the same, uh, um, you know, I'm based in Postle Park. There's a load of GPs based in Postle Park. There's various uh, uh, health visitors there, but they'll health visitors will email me about cases that we we share. I was at case. Uh, child protection case discussion just Friday with a health visitor who's not in the same building as me, but she'd been emailing me in preparation for that and for me seeing the child. And um, and just thank goodness for that health visitor who has stuck at her job for years because that family had had about five different social workers attached to them in a period of, of two or three years. And the health visitor was the person who really held that discussion together because she's the one person who's who, who's seen them through a whole variety of different changes that's on a 35-page chronology that nobody, you know, was able to read through in five minutes, but the health visitor had it all in her head. No, I just agree with that. I mean, I think alignment isn't a toxic word, and, and we do work as teams, um, but we still have that relationship where, where our practice has our, our health visitor who is our health visitor, although she works in the team within the health centre, and that, that's working absolutely fine. We just need more of her, I think. <laughs> yes. The question was asked, would you need more? And that's the issue, isn't yeah. it? We're, we're filled with the investment in health visiting, and we've got to train them now, though, um, because it took a long time to get around to it, so they won't appear <coughs> on the stocks, and we have to get the caseloads right. But actually, we have to. It comes back to a point I made about freeing people. I think that we've got too many bureaucratic processes. Sometimes people can see they could do something for vulnerable families, but they've got to go back through the routes, which, in fact, as I say, loses that moment of when they might have worked with a family and said they're nearly at the point of getting them to agree that this would be a good step to do. And by the time they go back through, knowing whether they can access that, they may have lost that moment. And these people who are working within that kind of world know that. And I think anything we can do to reduce bureaucracy on any measures that would actually be more accessible to them at the time would be a good thing. And there'll be good practice, and there'll be, Indeed. you know, and every, you know, we hear about all the the best practice when when, when we're sitting here as a committee. And we, yeah. we recently visited uh, a project in Edinburgh. Uh, can't remember what was the name of it. And we were asking about family and partnership, and they were dealing with older, uh, slightly older, uh, younger women and, uh, and and children. And there yeah. and, and there wasn't uh, on scant evidence there wasn't that. Integration. So there are there are projects. Yeah, right. There's family nurse partnerships. There's specific project. You know, there's That's a right. lot of resource there. Yeah. It's maybe not necessarily working to the best of effect sometimes. Yeah. Is that? But that was the point that was made by my colleague earlier on that we end up with too many projects, mm -hmm. and people then. So the next thing that we pilot, I have to say, and I've been part of pilots for years, and think that evaluate they're very important. But when we get too many pilots and not enough clarity about that's working, that's going to... And give it time to work, give mm. it the time to produce the efficacy, do we know, then we could, we could make a difference. But we do tend to kind of get the next thing that people think is, is important to do. And I, I would agree with you. I've gone out recently to visit a team where they were not connecting across mm -hmm. the area with each other. It was almost like their pilot was the one that was more important. And that's because it was short-term funding, and they thought if we focus on that, we might get the funding, rather than that looking at the whole service in a very different way. So I would wish that we could get a better way of setting up these projects and get them into more sustainable funding for those services. Yeah, but it's sometimes a problem we've heard in the committee. It's a bit not the new <coughs> projects are the problem. It's a bit letting go of the old. Of the old. Yeah, so yeah. we want the old that are not. Yeah. It's not as effective. Yeah. And we know the the new project is effective, and and uh, you know it's this inability to to discuss and and, and agree the issues of funding and the, the the priorities and what works. But Dr. Reynolds, two things. the two things that have happened in the last five or six years that have most helped me to coordinate the the care of, of vulnerable children and families were not things that were introduced for that purpose. It, it's been 
secure email that I can email colleagues, I can email health visitors, GPs, uh, consultants in the uh, hospital. Now it's even secure between us and the council, so I can be emailing social workers and uh, teachers, etc. And also clinical portal that I can... Uh, so IT system whereby I can be, rather than having to... Yeah. Uh, write to people at York Hill to find out what they're doing. Their their letters are up on yep. a. a yep. So those, you know, if we're always thinking of a project that's going to do this or a project that's going to do that, I'm not saying don't do them. Absolutely great. Evaluate and then we bring in the the, the try and mainstream the stuff that works well. But sometimes there are things that are going on just generically that we've never we've never thought to kind of evaluate evaluate and, and yet they're the most valuable things that we're doing and if we had better if we were better at looking at our routine data um perhaps we'd be able to build up more of an evidence base for some of the things that, that we've been doing for ages or that we've started doing for another reason not because they've been mandated through uh, some project that's yeah, been so made. it's an important yeah, it's an important point jean I would just agree with um, Dr. Reynolds that from our point of view, when we're, we're a centralised citywide service, so those constant phone calls to everybody else, and I think email, secure email, has made things considerably easier for us. Yeah. The weeks, yeah, absolutely. You keep missing people, and you. You've, is, you've is that missed. available or necessary even for the for the GPs practice to get that type of information? the portal and <clears throat> yeah it does it doesn't help with everything and, and I think the govern project what the govern project is trying to do is recreate a relationship that existed when I first started in general practice and that was the attached social worker in the health center that made a massive difference to how we worked um, and a part of that is about professional relationships and building up that professional relationships <coughs> but also the availability of being able to discuss cases and the government project now has, has recreated that again because we have no evidence to say that works, but all the GPs who remember working like that thought, thought it was a much better way of mm -hmm. working. It was much better, and it was easier to sort patients' issues out, etc., if you had attachment like that. Dr Reynolds, I'm, I'm, I'm not looking at members of the, the, the panellists or what he speaks, so you you need to sit and be patient and Richard Simpson's first dentist. Uh, the, the thing about the social... Because we used to have a social work resource worker, worker in our child development centre. We did each of the ones in Glasgow. Um, and they were never kind of evaluated any kind of way and eventually come 2008 and the money went from social work... You know, social work thresholds have just gone up and up and they pulled that service. And then the Healthier Wealthier Children project came up and came into Glasgow. Now it is fantastic, you know, I, and I refer to income maximisers all the time. But part of me was sitting listening to their presentations when they're saying, "Oh, and look, you know, we've increased the income of these families, and and particularly the ones with disability and the disability living allowance, and we've brought in all this." That's what the resource worker used to do, you know. Like, so we just we lost our resource worker who used to do that and a lot more. And then, but but because Healthy Wealthy Children was a project that was evaluated and what you know, I'm going and listening to, oh, isn't it fantastic? And it is, you know. I, I, I don't want to take anything away from Healthy Wealthy Children, but the resource workers were fantastic and they used to do all that, you know. But nobody ever noticed. Any other responses from panelists there? But no, uh, Richard Simpson. We're sort of in the last 15 minutes, so we'll get some questions. Been sitting here, feeling it's Groundhog Day, you know the. 1975, uh, Sir John Brotherson did his report on widening health inequalities. 1980, Black Report. 1998, the Aitchison Report. You know, we've been through this so often, and I think the point that you were making just now about recreation of things is important. Is 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 you know this this really keeps happening. I mean, what I find astonishing is the fact that you know, when you had a situation in which you had health health visitors attached and social workers attached, but the health visitor and the social worker actually were the key people managing the children. The, as a GP, the input was all about the background to the family, often the history, you know, the historical situation, because you had experience uh, within the practice, within the partnership about that. It seems to me that whatever system we have, and Teresa sort of mentioned it, okay, we've gone, it moved to a geographical basis. When social work moved to a geographical basis, the relationship collapsed because we didn't have a named person. So whatever system we have, surely, well, I don't know if the panelists would agree with us, we need two things. One is we need continuity. 
so that we don't have a different person dealing with this family and cases being opened and closed, which you never do in general practice. They're registered with you often for life, actually generations in the one practice, whereas social workers open and close cases. And if health visitors open and close cases, then you know it's really problematic. So how do you get that continuity? And the second thing is, everybody here today in this panel is medical or medical related. But actually the fundamental and what we're talking about in terms of health and social care integration is going beyond the issue of just the family and the family's downstream problems. It's actually the upstream problems. What do we do about traffic calming measures, separation of pedestrians and vehicles, child resistant containers, installation of smoke alarms, um, affordable heat in damp houses? And I'm just quoting one section of the McIntyre report of 2007. You know, what input do you all, as, as medically oriented, medically trained individuals, have to the upstream aspect of health inequalities? Uh, and if you don't have it, what are the barriers? Do you want it? And what are the barriers to it? Do we need it? Are we going to solve these problems without public health being actually based in local authorities, as they used to be, where they can influence all these things? Or are we, should we, you know... Are we really aligning health visitors and social workers adequately within these new geographic teams? Sorry, I've Any takers? On, but I, I've just been round it so often in, in 35, 40 years. Jane? Uh, just to make the point, I, I don't think health visitors ever close cases in the same way as social workers do, and I think it's appropriate. It's a different, it's a different kind of work we do. So just, just that point, once a health visitor is allocated, I mean, and as Lucy said, the... the you know, the ideal situation would be for a family to have the same health visitor from, you know, from when the baby's born or, or before in an ideal world, thinking about how the family nurse partnership works and how when I started health visiting, how we worked, yeah. the GP would give us a list of the women who were pregnant and, and we'd make sure we went out and, and touched base with them. And is um, that still happening? Not, it's not. Not no, routine. And that's, we've lost yeah. that. So we have to create the family nurse partnership because we've lost that. Sorry. I, I, I do feel a little bit, I mean, I know that the family nurse partnership has got 30 years of, of um, evaluation and things in the States and, and is apparently very, you know, very successful. But there's a, there's, there is a little bit of me that thinks <coughs> when I, I mean, I've read quite a lot because I did apply for one of the posts in the family nurse partnership because I was really interested in it because to my mind, it, it does mimic what health visiting should be and what, to some extent, what we used to do and probably not. Um... Dr Saunders. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would very much agree with Richard. It's slightly outside my brief, but many, many decades ago, I too was a GP uh, in a deprived rural area and we had attached health visitors and attached social workers and they were invaluable in helping us to help the most deprived members of, of, of our, our practice population, uh, that they were very good. The only thing I, I would add is that uh, putting public health into local authorities has been done in England and it's been an abject failure with uh, local authorities uh, trousering the budget and, uh, sorry, to use a different term, local authorities using the budget for different things and the mm -hmm. public health workforce disappearing at a rate of knots. Uh, it, it's not worked well. Dr Reynolds. Um, I was working in, in, as part of the public health team at the time when we had CHCPs in, in, in Glasgow City, and that was the time when there was the health visiting review. And so our health visitors were being managed by social work managers. Um, and whilst I, you know, absolutely, OK, I do occasionally prescribe the odd melatonin or laxative or something I'm mostly a very social paediatrician not just that I'm sociable I you know I'm uh, I'm forever writing letters in support of rehousing uh, in support of asylum claims or um, uh, I don't know or, um, and and wanting a support from uh, you know more kind of social type uh, social work type support but it isn't really there but um, but my observations um, when there were social work managers managing health visitors was that it was not successful because 
they do not come from a background of universalism. Um, and so because they've got this concept of isolated episodes, um, that, you know, I think that's partly why our health visiting review was, I think it's been concluding that it was pretty unsuccessful and it went the wrong way and, you know, it, it's, it's now been reversed. And I also reflect with the Sure Start... Um, Children's centres, uh, what was it? Sure, some of the Sure Start evaluation down south. Um, th some of the most successful projects were, were were led by health. I mean, I know I'm from, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, I I love social workers and I love working with them and everything. But 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 and also you mentioned about Al Ainsley Green as a leader, um, as a paediatrician. Um, that I think when it comes to the universalism side of things, people in people from whether it's general practice or health visiting or whatever get it and that whilst there are aspects of integration which I would welcome having non-health people try to manage universal stuff when they don't have any experience of that I, I think has been unsuccessful in the past. Theresa Faith. Um, I'm going to come back to my point about the difference between attachment and alignment. Mm -hmm. When RONIC happened it did break up an inordinate amount of the way health visitors had worked in some areas, because some areas proceeded with RONIC faster than others, so it led to a breakup. Without question, since the review that's been done and it's been stopped, it's been brought <coughs> back to the idea that health visitors work as a team working aligned with the GP practice and others, because it's a multi-agency world that they're in now, which in fact would bring what you're talking about, because through that they would get, be able to understand better the things that they see that could make a difference. But what didn't happen was the when social worker was taken away, as that resource was taken away, that was not seen then as an aligned relationship anymore. It became something over there. And that's the point I made about integration. If we come back to integration, and the intention is we're going to try and bring that together, we're going to have to bring that aligned relationships back together in a way of working. But there is a principal difference in how the health has been about need and Sometimes within, obviously within in local authority funding, it's not been about need, it's about available resource. So you can have a very different view. We've talked about this a lot when we were talking about the changeover. So at the moment, the health service would say, we respond to the need and we must do that, a universal service of core. But that wouldn't be the case necessarily within other services. So that's what I meant by that coming together when we do that. It was not a success when... It was seen as, because it was said, that's what happened. They would say, you don't need, you have to close your cases. That person no longer has a need of you, or we don't have enough resource. We have to find a way of measuring the workload, understanding the need and demand, and then looking at how we best do that. When, when in the past, health visits were attached, the evidence showed that if they were attached in some areas, the deprivation was greater somewhere else and the resource was elsewhere. And it was really hard to say to one area, could you give us back that resource, thank you, because we need it over here, because it had been part of that. So I could never want to go back to that, because it should be about those aligned relationships, but you know and understand what your need is, how you measure it, and then how you allocate the teams to work within that. But it has to be multi-agency too, because that's the best way to get the breadth of, of uh, understanding of families and situations. Richard, do you want to yeah, um, quickly? Yeah, yeah. Just to, to support what Theresa has been saying, and I think Anne might want to comment on it, that we, the inverse care law is absolutely critical to all this, that unless you apply the resource... In Scotland, we're very lucky. We have a GP for every patient in Scotland. They didn't have that in England. They had real problems with it. So we do have it, but it's, a, it's an equal distribution, not a distribution on the basis of need. And that's the problem. And really, we have to find a system whereby need and resource are aligned. Uh, you know, I, I, and I think Matt, you know, Anne may want to comment on that, that we do, you know, the resource applied to, G, to GP practices in deprived areas, even the link workers are just really at the edges, I think. I think that, I mean, obviously I would talk as a GP, wouldn't I? But, I mean, the, the DA general practice is now becoming stretched and stretched and stretched, partly because of the, the demographics of the population we're serving now, and you all know about the complexity of care, etc. But the assumption that somehow these complex patients can always be managed in the community with limited resource is, is just not realistic anymore. Uh, and general practice does need more resource, i.e. more GP bodies and more GP time. Uh, and you, I, I don't really think you can get away from that. 
Um, and Stuart Mercer's work has shown the benefits of that. It's not that people get better because you give them more time, but it delays them getting worse. And that's what a lot of what we're trying to do is delay this, you know, constant going into hospital, becoming <coughs> sicker earlier. You know, it, for us to do the job that we're supposed to be doing, you, you do need more GPs and you do more GP time. It, it's, it's just becoming a, an impossible job to do now. And I've worked in general practice for 20, 20 odd years now. And, and you know, for the first time I've had a district nurse saying to me, I can't go and see that patient, I just don't have the time. You know, and this is what's happening at the front line. And who's the default position when all that happens and services are not meeting uh, the service user's needs? It comes back to the general practice to sort out. We are the default position for just about every other service. So I think the DPEN has been very clear on what we think we need. Child health inequalities is part of that issue. The contract could be more uh, robust, I think, the GP contracts around child health. Um, health visitors, it's great they're investing in more health visitors, that's really, really welcome, but it will take a bit of time for them to bed in. Uh, the government project is really trying to rationalise under severe budget cuts how we can better work with social work because we realise that's a relationship that's been missing for quite a long time and we can do more around that. Um, but in terms of the day job, I think GPs, they, they do need more GP time and more GPs. You know? and that's expensive, <coughs> but that's the reality. Dr. Gray. Yeah, I, just, I, I um, agree with everything that's being said about um, you know targeting resources to deprived areas and um, you know about improving universal services and so on. But one thing I feel, and, and it kind of relates to something you said. Well, you know, are we really? You know, we might be moving anything up, but are we making a difference? And I think um, I was reading the evidence on the website from the um, Centre for Excellence and Looked After children and they point out you know there's 16,000 of these children in um, in Scotland 4,000 in, in Glasgow alone um, for years I worked in the in the in the prisons and um, you know most of the the people I saw had been looked after at some stage in their their childhood um, I think you find that their suicide rate something like a hundred times the suicide rate in the general child population I, I think we do need, you know, people say um, mind the gradient as well as the gap, but I think that's a group where we can identify them fairly easily, um, although getting kind of routine data on them is another matter. There's now this shared agenda around integration, um, you know, where, where social work and health are, you know, meant to, to be worked together. I mean, maybe that's a group where it's possible to put some resources to try and make a real difference in the way that some Scandinavian countries have achieved, where they find, you know, very little difference between the outcomes of looked after children and those who aren't. I mean, I would say we need to aim for something like that. So, um, coming back to the initial question about what could this new advisor do, I mean, I, I still stick by what I say, you know, go by the evidence and so on. But if, if they were to say to me, what one thing would you do? I would concentrate on that um, particular group uh, and try and improve things for them, particularly since we're going to be corporate parents for them. Um, and I think you know we've got we've got a, a, a kind of um, an expectation. I think I think we I think we should do a lot better by that um, by that group than we do. I think you, you um, we're into the last you know five or you know ten minutes, and what what I will do. I think it's only fair to, you know, given social works have been bashed about a wee bit here. <laughs> Dennis is bracing himself, he's sitting his back there, you see. Uh, uh, Dennis uh, Robertson's a former social worker who's with us today and he's sat patiently there for about um, uh, 15 minutes. So I'm going to, uh, I'm not, you know, decide what question you're going to answer, Dennis, but uh, Dennis, uh, Dennis has uh, wished to ask a question and then... Um, I intend to come back to the panelists. I think uh, Dr. Gay gave us um, a, a useful, you know, st you know, step there yeah. that I'm going to ask people if they've got to to wrap up that, that you know, that uh, that 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 one thing you would uh, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five things, but you know, just something that they they would look, wish to place on record today. I think that is useful, yeah. and it gives us a a bit of a roundup to our discussion. 
Dennis Robertson, uh, former uh, social worker <laughs> in Berkeley. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, convener. Uh, I'm glad it's on public record that someone loves social workers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was a social worker for over 30 years, uh, and uh, yes, I did start uh, Glasgow in Berkeley, which was uh, uh, a wonderful experience. Now, I'm just wondering, I mean, basically, I, I actually endorse the whole aspect of multi-agency and identifying the appropriate key worker, and I had a great deal of empathy with uh, uh, Richard Simpson when you know he was saying he'd you know, gone round this uh, several times, um, you know, because we, we have in, in many ways and in many forms. But I'm just wondering if, coming back to maybe an earlier point that Dr Gray made, and I think it was basically, it was about the localisation, and do we need to sort of focus more on uh, looking at the local solutions for the local problems without then pointing the finger to say that we've entered into sort of postcode lottery, because that's a dreadful term anyway. But, you know, sometimes it, it is important to have the local solutions for the local problems. Uh, and, you know, we need maybe a framework, yes, but have we moved away from that localisation, I wonder? Is there any response? Theresa Fife. Um. I think that's a really good point. But you see, it comes back to localisation sometimes is funded by the short-term funding. Yeah. So I think that there's a lot of these projects stem from local activity or people think, oh, that's a good idea, let's do that. But they don't actually get funded and they don't get mainstreamed in a way that would help them. Localisation is a big part of the integration agenda. It's intended to get as close to communities where they are, which in turn supports other activities. So I think it's a good point. Maybe you can re respond to this. Uh, Professor Marmot, when he was here, po pointed out, that although he was very sceptical at the time, that Birmingham and I think Tower Hamlets are one of the uh, inner uh, city areas, had adopted his principles and were working through that. And he was impressed how they had you know, uh, uh, delivered on those principles in those localities. They had actually made a difference. Does anyone know about that in terms of uh, uh, re re you know, your response to Dennis's local, um, uh, local initiative? Dr Saunders. Uh, I, I wouldn't like to speak about those particular areas, uh, but I, I would say that while, yes, local action will help uh, and will help... Um, a number of people, it also allows government to get off the hook and a lot of the problems that people get arise from government policy and what local action does is help mitigate those effects. And Again, I would go back to saying we, we need to improve the lot of all children in, in Scotland and some, some children more than others. But you know, by lifting everybody up, you also lift up the people who are at the bottom who most desperately need help. They need additional help, but like a great number of, of benefits uh, in the benefit system that, that have existed, by making them universal, it's much easier for people who are on the margins to access them. It's much less uh, socially stigmatising for people to receive them, and it makes life generally easier. Now, there are other, you know, as we've said, the, the people who are most deprived need additional help, but you're going to get most of the people by giving stuff to all of the people and there's a small number who need extra if you just try and focus on the tiny number who perhaps we could call them the deserving poor um, there's a number of undeserving poor that we're going to miss out on and I, I would really suggest that we we go for a, a let's improve everybody approach with a bit of extra for some yes Dr Reynolds yeah I mean an issue with things being local is that whenever you start talking about localities, you start talking about boundaries. And, and therefore, I suppose because I'm a specialist, therefore I've got to cover a, lo a load of localities because you're not going to have one community paediatrician for, for um, Postle Park and another community paediatrician for Springburn and another community paediatrician for Ruck Hill or whatever. I've got to cover a large area because I'm, I'm a specialist. And then if you're more of a super specialist at, at, a, at a children's hospital, you're going to cover an even wider area. And so as, as, as soon as you uh, implement things that are only within a certain locality, then what about the people that are just over the border of that locality? Or how do you coordinate things between the local thing that's here and the local thing that's there? So I think it makes sense for different things to be done at different levels. You know, yes, there are some things that it'll make sense to do locally, but you've got to 
do some things at a national level so that they're, you know, this, what we're saying about universalism. Anyway, regardless of its, you know, local or that wider community, you know, that multi-agency approach to resolving the problems, you know, is, is that the solution? Yes. You know, and to talk about the government project again, sorry, that it hasn't even been funded yet. <laughs> but, I mean, our idea is that if you work within the locality with a cluster of GPs within a, a reasonable size population number, it's about 30,000, you can start to determine what the needs of that population are. So you have to do the, the sort of super epidemiology stuff, but you also have to do the localised epidemiology as well. So mm -hmm. we look at what our population needs are, what are the, what are the third sector agencies in that locality of population you know, what are the specific issues we have in Govan? It could be a large asylum-seeking population that it gets very variable, but we need to respond to where there's no services attached to that, you know, things like that. So there does have to be that, uh, that kind of local level that links into national politics. There's an understanding of where the links are, I think. Um, and again, embedding all of that is, is these long-term professional relationships that are really important to make interagency working work. This patient, are they in East Dumbartonshire or do they live in, in uh -huh. Glasgow? If they're in Glasgow, do they live in North West yeah. Glasgow or North East Glasgow? You know, before I decide who I liaise with uh -huh. or what they might be entitled yes. to, etc. Well, I mean, it's, as Richard said, we've been dealing with this for how long? To, it's, since Richard was a boy. Uh, and um, <laughs> maybe not just as long as that. You know, but it, 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 you know, it fits in with many of the things that the committee do struggle with about, you know, the... the We'd all argue that uh, we should defend and, uh, and you know, the, the, the health spending. We should be, you know, be protecting it from any of the cuts. But, you know, we've recognised this morning that the living in, on this agenda is, is, is not just about the funding of hospitals and, and whatever. You know, there's a, you know, the health service is protected, local government isn't. So you've got a, a problem there right away in terms of our ambition to deliver more services and the community, but uh, it's been an interesting discussion. I don't feel any particular pleasure, uh, pressure to respond to this question, but if anyone wants to, I'm looking at Theresa there, is, uh, you know, that, that, that one single thought that you want to leave with us uh, this morning, or your top priority or whatever, now's the chance. Don't wait until you're on the bus going home and say, that. Oh, wish I'd have said that. I'm yes. going to come back to what I've said it a couple of times. I think it's the evidence the data and the evaluation and um, I think if we can really grapple with that we might know better what we're trying to achieve yeah, and what's working and I thought your point made about understanding that work that had been done I've seen I saw a tv program that described what they were doing it sounded great but do we know did it sustain did it stay and my final point is community I was here for part of your evidence session on communities working together and what community empowerment looked like and I think that we forget the power of that. There's a whole lots of things happen within health that happen because of community support by individuals or by groups. Yeah. And I think if we can harness that together, we have a better chance of tackling it and not see divides between who's got which bit of it. Okay. Dr. Reynolds. Um, for me, the o the overriding thing on how we Im improve the well-being of children and reduce inequalities in in child well-being is about reducing stresses on parents um, and reducing the unequal stresses on parents because the, the stresses cluster and that, that some of that's at a societal level so making having a society that is more financially equitable um, and some of it is at an, uh, uh, an individual level and that health visitors, GPs, etc. are key in terms of going out there and finding out what those stresses are and advocating for them to be uh, dealt with. Because all the programmes we bring in, if the parents are under too much stress to actually do them, um, they're not going to work. Anyone else? <coughs> Dr Saunders? At, at, at the risk of probably repeating myself more than once, uh, I, I do think there's a great need for a healthy public policy, and that will come from government, where people who can be helped uh, you know, through education and equality, equity of education and opportunity, they need to have a healthy public policy creating an environment in which healthy and choices and choices that will help them and their children's health are made easier rather than more difficult so that the, the healthy option isn't the more difficult one as it currently is for all too many things. 
So it's okay, you found your save, would you like to add anything? No, 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 just, just accept to combine a bit and say the evidence data and evaluation, I like that too, so I would add that on to that particular group, using that to improve outcomes for that particular group. Yeah. Jane? Um, I mean, just a, I mean, I suppose from a, a professional point of view and knowing and, and believing that best outcomes for children, um, health visitors are really well placed to deliver um, the best outcomes for children. And just anecdotally, I suppose what Dr. Gray said about looked after children, just my experience working both, I worked in uh, Base 75, which is a project for women involved in street prostitution. A huge number of those women had come through the care system. And also my work in homelessness and, and homeless families particularly. Um, in the individuals, we see ex-prisoners, lots of whom have, have been through the care system, and also the families that we see. So I think it's a, an area, certainly, of um, deprivation that could... Dr. Mullen, last but not least. Can I say two things? Well, can yes. GPs have more time? But also, can we uh, imagine things within the child rights perspective? Because I think that's a really interesting question and it focuses people's minds on, on, on what the impact of policies are, I think. Well, I'm going to bring this session to a close. Can I thank you all very much for your valuable time and uh, evidence provided uh, today? Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Um, we are now going into private session, as we previously agreed. Good, thank you. <laughs>